Yo, 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 yo. Oh, choice where you sit on. Yeah, so. That's the right one. Good stuff. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, mate. Happy days. If you just kind of push that around a bit. Sweet. Man. Bloody oath, Ryan. Oh. How long have you been home for? I uh, got back Wednesday, so you yeah, flew up from uh, from Nelson, uh, from Nelson, and yeah, back to the old stomping grounds and <laughs> visit the old man helping out on the farm. So S- straight into um, what do we got here, mate? That's water. Fizzy f- we fizzy water, is it? We fizzy water. Oh, nice. We actually um had a few wines out on the the uh, concrete deck there, and what are these? Low sugar apple cider. Because mm. I know you'll be watching your figure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something like that, anyway, eh? Oh, yum. Hopefully, now that. Scapegoat. Sure. I haven't seen these before. You know, in the local countdown. <laughs> it smells, like, <laughs> smells like your old rotten apples that have been sitting in the old gutters for a wee bit, eh? <laughs> Well, what are those ones? Orchard Thieves, eh? That's basically... Mm. basically oh, that's Basically what that is. Not a big cider man, but that's good, eh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Shit. Don't mind that. We'll do it right. That's basically what driving through Hawke's Base smells like, eh? It just smells like cider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All yeah, the apples. Yeah, yeah. So the old man's, you know, straight into milking the cows. Yeah, straight into milking the cows. To be honest, I've only... It was my first milking today, actually. Yeah. Um, getting back into it, so... Uh, yeah, been helping out a wee bit just in and around the farm and just been up with the cousins and aunties and uncles and stuff, a few Christmas things over the weekend, so yeah, yeah, just got back home today and then, yeah, milk this afternoon and got the job done and then, yeah, bike here, so. How many are on the farm? Uh, staff or cows? <laughs> cows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not many staff and was about, just over 500 cows at the moment, five cents, split calving, so uh, milking all year round and, yeah, so. Make the big bucks in the winter, so town supply. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, yeah. So, nah, it's all good, mate. Do you still own some? Yeah, yeah. I got a couple actually. Um, we just had a herd test the other week, and Dad's got this family. It's, he calls it the Freak Family, mm. and um, and kind of like his top cows, and he's been breeding off them quite a bit. And I got this one cow in particular that I bought from Minesville to Minesville what you call a Mosel special, you know, just bit of, bit of a drag and um bread. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's a a special cow. Yeah, like a little bit special. Um <laughs> and um and then bred off her a couple of generations and uh, yeah, um one of her granddaughters has actually uh, just toppled some of dad's cows in the in the last herd test. So uh yeah, yeah got one up on them there already. So nah, they're going all right, eh? a couple of them and yeah, a couple of donkeys I've had to send off on the cow truck last couple of weeks actually, but Apart from that, going pretty well. So, so I don't really know what what's in the herd test. What are you looking for, mate? Uh, you're looking for a high protein test, so high protein, high fat, really, which is which equals what a milk solid is, which is mm-hmm. what you get paid for. So, you've basically got protein and fat in in your milk, mm-hmm. and the rest of it's almost just water. Yeah. So, um, the more tests you have um, in terms of protein and fat, the better. Yeah. Um, and also in volume, so. Um, it's done off your total milk solids so a cat like at the moment um, you know the good girls are got kind of doing between 2.2 and maybe 2.5 milk solids at the moment um, and that's based off a formula f- fat times protein times volume um, equals their milk solids so um, yeah you're looking for volume in that the aspect really so yeah yeah, yeah. so how does, how does your sort of ownership of your cows work like Obviously, you're on, you're on your old mate, old man's farm. Like you, you own the cow, but how do you get paid for her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a funny one. Um, so it started off one day, and I kind of worked for you know six or so months, and didn't get paid at all for 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 any work. I oh, know I must have been about ten or something at the time, milking and rearing the calves and all of that. And then Dad just gave me a calf, and then you kind of you just rear it up with all the others. You don't treat it any different really and read up with all the others and dad gets paid for all the milk so basically it's his cow but i own it mm-hmm. so in terms of all the offspring um i own and i can sell i you know i can do whatever with 
but he gets all the money for the milk so that pays for its grazing kind of thing yep. so we just cancel that out and basically it's you know it's a win-win you know you, you build numbers in your herd and yeah um you don't have to lift a finger really so you get to choose the bulls that you breed over them and yeah, cool as long as he agrees and yeah happy days <laughs> so like as you said this this uh special one from Morrinsville is doing quite well uh what what happens if it's the flip side and he says Ryan that cow's shit it's got to go <laughs> <laughs> then, then it goes to the works and you get the works money for it so uh, we, we actually sent a couple off not that long ago and he, I think he got about 12 1300 for them which actually isn't too bad for a few old bags off to the works but <laughs> um, yeah you know there's ups and downs to it so sometimes you get a couple of generations out of it and then if she doesn't get in calf then you know most of the time those are the ones that end up going off to the works but mm-hmm. yeah so so you said you got that um winter milking going on is is that a few that that missed missed the spring or yeah so it's ideal for for your cows that kind of don't get in calf through the spring and then you can actually just keep milking them through for another couple of months get them in calf for the autumn calving mm. following so that you basically end up milking them for like 18 months Oof. or well it's you, you milk them for about 12 months but the cycle is 18 months for mm-hmm. them um because they kind of miss half a cycle um before they get back in calf so um, and because you know, in most circumstances, you'd you'd actually send those cows either off on the cow truck, or you have to just dry them off and hold on to them for a yeah. whole whole season without milking them and they even grass, so <laughs> costing you money. Whereas you know, with a split carbon, it that's the perks of that. You can keep those cows on and keep milking them for that extra couple of months, then get them in calf for the following yeah. mating. So, so you guys just giving them one cycle to get in calf. Uh, two cycles two cycles okay and then the bulls go out and then if they're still empty yeah then we'll milk them through if 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 we're going to keep them uh we'll milk them through and then try and get them in calf for the following calving whether it's spring or autumn mm-hmm. depends uh what time of the year that is so Oof. yeah and um, so, so how tight's the calving period uh jesus that's usually oh you always have a couple of cows floating around at the end there and kind of mid-September but um, start of June it's usually heifers carving down about start of June June, July, August so like oh, it's like two mu- or two and a half three months really um, yep. in the spring autumn's a, a bit shorter they've kind of I think we only give them one cycle and then put the bulls out so yeah um, yeah well it's kind of their second chance isn't it yeah yeah second chance <laughs> Charlie yeah <laughs> sponsored by two degrees but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Well, fuck you! You would tell me just before that might almost be you, mate. So you chance, Charlie, <laughs> using the oh, TV shit, show mate. to get a contract, bro. <laughs> just about far out. Yeah, day one battler, eh? Day one battler. <laughs> yeah, but. No, it's good. Um, so here I was thinking that you'd be going to Sydney, play the Waratahs, and defend your name on um, Isaac John's podcast. But you, mate, you're gonna have to pay for your own flight to get over there to defend your name. Yeah, I know. Come on, Ice. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a shout out, like top five hottest guys in Toke, surely. I don't mean, look at him, he's a specimen. Yeah, no, they, they went for the skinny boys, the typical rugby league guys, they went for the skinny boys, not not the ones doing the job. Yeah, they, they've gone for the old shredded, chiselled rigs of the rugby league boys, like, not the classic, you know, burly, burly rugby union guys, but hey, it's all good. I've been doing upper body for the last 12 weeks, so, you know, like, the pins are looking a little bit narrow at the moment, but, you know, hopefully the, the old sleeve's looking a bit bigger, but, yeah. yeah. So what's the motivation, rhythm and vines, or... Bay Dreams now, son. What, what's going on? <laughs> no, neither, actually. Neither, mate. Just uh, just get, you know, a bit bigger on the old upper body and yep. just bench three times a week. And, uh, nah, um, just get back on the field fitter, faster, bigger, stronger, really. So um, when I get back in April from uh, from my ankle injury, then, yeah, just hopefully just be, you know, an absolute beast on the field. So Beast mode, beast um, mode. Yeah, no, just get the body good nick for that and yep. ready to go. So, yeah. so what did you do to yourself? Uh, broken ankle, so basically playing rugby that way. Yeah, yeah, playing playing for Tasman against Waikato was it about oh, round fuck. three, I think. So yeah, um, yeah, I actually uh, spiral fracture up the should I always get these wrong up the fibula, smaller one, and displaced the tibula, so tib was sitting outside the ankle joint kind of thing. So it was kind of like dislocated and spiral fracture up the fib. So um, I had to put a plate in that um, and a few screws, and then tight rope between the tib and the fib pull it back together and stitch it all back up <laughs> oh it's actually staples this one but yeah nah it's um 
I was feeling pretty good and yeah out of my moon boot I think it was about three four weeks ago now so yeah yeah moving around and you know calf raises a lot I eat calf raises breakfast lunch and dinner at the moment so yeah um yeah. in the kitchen bench cutting onions you calf raising in the couch you're putting the cups on your calf raising like yeah. in the gym squatting your calf raising like so nah it's all good mate there we go um what was his name farm fit calf raises while putting the cups on yeah, shit, yeah. And then he gets up the end and, and does a few. Although, what sort of shit he got? You on hairy bone? Yeah, hairy bone. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you get up the end and do a few dips and a few chin ups. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't do chin ups, mate. The old, the old pipes up above us. <laughs> <laughs> not strong enough for this reggae. Eh? No. I used to get away with it when I was about 100 clicks, but yeah, no, nah, not anymore. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> no, it's good. Oh, far out. So, like, what's what's the rehab been like? We're just, you have to hang, hang around the team and. Yeah, so through you probably you probably must have got team man of the year this year, right? With those sunglasses, <laughs> supporter of the year, maybe. No, nah, almost. I just got given the most shit of the year. There. <laughs> um, so no, no, I couldn't do too much actually. I was just so I was in a in my soft cast for or in my cast for a couple of weeks out of surgery, and then from there into the moon boot, um, and I couldn't do any like as, as such rehab on on that stuff. I could only do a bit of quad and glute work on on like you know, what do you call it resistance band work and stuff mm-hmm. on on my crook side and then um just heaps of upper body and but off feet conditioning and that was about it so um yeah hung around the team with tasman till the end of the season and helped out wherever i could there and you know just kind of get the off field just culture keep going and, i was about to say that it looked um, like you weren't far from making sure the beverages were on hand oh yeah 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 no always full always full um <laughs> so yeah can't can't be seen with the empty vessel mate but um so yeah and then um obviously after the season finish i was starting to get into my rehab about then and um getting the ankle moving and the calf going so mm-hmm. um yeah starting to get into a lot of run tech the last couple of weeks so um Te- isn't technique yeah like your so-called a march b march yep, yep. foot patterns, um that kind of stuff so uh, i'm trying to just build up that well, i'm used to the words of shit but the old fucking um Oh, what do you call it like your resistance on yep. not like the ground shock like as in stomping your foot without giving way kind of thing un- under mm-hmm. the tension mm-hmm. so um, you know your calf raises build all of that up, all that tolerance up and then being able to um, build up that resistance we, we'd be a bit proud of you mate hey March <laughs> oh yeah mate 100% <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you talked to Sharan um, did, has he sort of given you a bit of Ben Patrick knees over toes getting getting some Patrick <laughs> step ups going like yeah no I, he hasn't actually but yeah no I had a good yarn with Sharan but um nah so yeah been working on the old mobility a wee bit and um yeah. I've usually always had pretty good mobility in my ankles and whatnot it's because there's not much there so um you know you can kind of move in any direction but uh yeah nah it's uh it's going pretty well so yeah yeah and uh, any any sort of super science going on? Nobody's putting electric shocks on your quads to keep them big. No, just some of those Fijian leaves. Whatever, oh yeah, yeah. Was, yeah a few of those things. No. Called up Waisaki's uncle, <laughs> was it? Yeah, yeah, something like that. A few relatives over in Fiji sort me out. Eh? It I'll was be a, back on the field in January, not not April, mate. But yeah, that no. was amazing. That that recovery he had. Hey? Yeah, shit, yeah. But no, I wish, I wish. So no, it's doing the old school way and just doing it, doing it once, doing it right. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully, it's going to come back bigger, faster, stronger than uh, than the other calf. So, yeah, yeah. So how long how long you had Nelson now? Three, um, three years, four years? Uh, five. So I've just finished, it out. <laughs> just, just finished my fifth season with the match Chiefs. But yeah, um, only played the two games this year. I've had a couple of seasons like that. But um, yeah, no, it's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And mm. um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of just been almost turning point in the last couple of months. You're kind of like fuck. Well, you know, he's got to do everything right now to kind of get your body right so that you can't get injured like you know it's kind of you just go about your business when you're young and you're like no mm. oh, i think you're invincible and stuff but you know you start to learn your lessons when if you're not ready to play footy that's when you get injured so do you Shit. apparently <laughs> apparently <laughs> especially running into some of the guys that we run into but <laughs> yeah so uh, the game that you injured yourself did you just win that no, we got pumped. Oh. Um, so that brings me on to my next question. How is Chucky um, losing to his brother twice? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> he'll never hear the end of it. And, um, and yeah, he'll never hear the end of it. Much like myself, my own, like, I think the only one that was on my side out of all my family was my mum. <laughs> she was the only, only one cheering for uh, Tasman because, uh, 
everyone else, me family, me uncles, me grandparents, they're all Waikato through and through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, none of them were going for Tasman. Not that game and nor the final. So um, yeah, no, I guess I guess at least with the, the Nor up there. Yeah, at least with the Norrises, like the parents live in, in Bay of Plenty, so they can be semi neutral, but oh losing to your younger brother, buddy yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, for sure. It's it's not the one eh? it's yeah. not the one, but yeah, we got pumped there and then obviously uh, the close one in the final at Waikato Stadium there is, um, yeah, tough on a swallow, but, you know, at the end of the day, they scored more points, and that's how you win a rugby game, so, and they did well. It is, and, it is. You know, some good defence, and, and uh, yeah, you know, we'll just take that one on the chin and move <laughs> on. <laughs> so, so what's um, what's the finest attraction of Nelson? <sighs> we were actually talking about this last night, that, you know, um, one of the boats was complaining about Nelson... Uh, what, what Who was that? What was his issue? Can't re- oh, I can't even remember. It was something pathetic, and then he confessed that he was only there for a day. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like uh, his whole his whole one experience cloud, clouded his impression of Nelson. But uh, 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 I've, I've I've managed to spend a little bit of time in Nelson, a couple of swimming carnivals, and summer holiday there at uh, at the beach, yeah, to yeah. Tahuna campground. Yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, then, what's your opinion on Nelson oh, before I it's, you know, uh, take it away? You know sunny that they were they're always trying to have a battle with um with hawks bay about around sunshine capitals <laughs> yeah, but um yeah. we all know the truth that actually invercargill due to its latitude gets the most sunshine so you know we'll put that to bed yeah i, I think shadbolt probably you know he's put something in the water around that one like the people down there but that's all right you know <laughs> <laughs> no, the old, um, um stayed at mapo uh camping ground there so oh, yeah. got a few eyeballs while we're walking around the camping grounds. Yeah, that's a dodgy camping <laughs> mate. Like, yeah, nah, don't go there, eh? There's some weird people down there, eh? Yeah. What? Ate at the smokehouse. That was bloody delicious, actually. Oh, that's good. Yeah, the yeah. one in... Um, at in, in, uh, at, at Mapua. Oh. Oh, oh, yeah, the smoke, the smokehouse fish and chip shop, whatever yeah. it is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Only yeah, trouble was well. we've been kayaking around the estuary, which, geez, don't go there on the change of tide. You'll end up out in, out yeah. in the ocean. Yeah, the currents are that, much, that big there, eh? Yeah, but I had itchy ass the whole time. I was very <laughs> distracted. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get up to the night before? No, it was just <laughs> wet bum, wet bum, sitting, yeah, on, yeah. sitting on a wooden seat. And yeah. yeah. Nah, no. Nelson's pretty unreal, eh? It's... You know, quite a small small city. I think it's a population about forty or fifty thousand, and mm. it's pretty spread out along the coastline. There, it's um, I don't know, real in terms of the rugby scene and stuff, like real community vibe, and everyone gets in behind. How wide like, does it go? Uh, it probably takes you. Do you go to Reefton and stuff so, like that? No, 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 shit, no, no. But like in terms of the area of like the city and everything, you know, it goes from Adawai out to Richmond there, yeah, and then out to Brightwater, um, and then. Yeah, I oh know. It'll take without traffic, you know, twenty minutes from one side to the other, and but you know, it only goes a couple of k back onto the hills because it's all built across the hills there. And um, oh, excuse me, shit. Um, and then bubbles, um, yeah, a few bubbles in the old cider. Thanks, mate. And then um, yeah, but no, nah, it's just an awesome wee. I oh know coastal city. It's kind of like in a way like a bit like the Mount, but just on a way way smaller scale. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just with the beach there and the water, it's just so relaxing and just chilly vibes. Eh, like. It's because there's not really waves there, eh? No, no. <laughs> oh, like, you can you can go out the boulder bank and surf out there. Well, I'm no no surfer myself. Like yeah. getting this rig up on a board, good luck. Um, but um, yeah, at the beach itself, it's also sheltered. Like awesome for the kids. Not that I have kids, but you know, yeah. like if you have kids, then awesome take them down there, rowdy rah. But like, um, and it's all good to go down there for a swim post training and, and mm-hmm. whatnot. It's quite nice. So um, oh no, it's just it's just a pretty relaxing kind of a, a city and place to live and. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's pretty choice, so easy to get around. So, yeah. do, do you go to like uh, Motueka and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Head out to Martin, out to Kaiteri there. Yeah, that's what I say, Kaiteri. That's yeah. a hell of a beach. Yeah, it's quite nice out there. Eh? Quite like little Kaiteri, the the wee beach yeah. off to the side there. Wee bit better, easier to like swim in and a bit nicer and stuff. I reckon, eh? But um, yeah, both are quite nice and um, yeah, spend a bit of time out Ruby Bay and Rabbit Island as well. Yeah. Like a couple of nice spots out there. So yeah, nah, it's all good. Eh? And then you've got Cable Bay down the other end. Um, on your way to Blenheim there okay. Cable Bay up that way is not a bad we spot and a couple of walks up up the hill there as well you know burn walk, a few walk up hill dear. Uh, I don't no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no I, I crawl up the hill yeah, yeah. Um, even when I'm fit yeah. Um, yeah, so, is, so. That, is that the uh, pre-season killer up the hill is it 
Uh, I've only done it once. Done it once? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not your scene? No, no, not really. I'd rather just park up with a box of beer down the bottom, actually, and yeah. uh, once everyone else walk up there. But no, nah, no, nah, due to go back up there again, it's I think it takes about 50-odd minutes, 45 minutes, and it's just straight uphill. Yeah. Um, no, nah, it's pretty wicked views up there. Not a bad wee spot, so good for a picnic or something like that. Yeah, well, yeah, nice. Yeah, take nice. a few beers up there. <laughs> Who are the uh, surfy boys? Um... I don't think too many of the boys in the team, oh, n- not really any of the guys surf during the season, but they always, um, oh, Hunty and Nank and Quinn and Bruce, they always uh, got the old binos out, yeah. having a wee look, seeing who's uh, cutting a few shapes on the old water mm-hmm. um, when the surf's up. But, Chucky, um, Chucky doesn't surf? I don't think so. He probably tries. Like, I saw a wee Instagram story of, uh, was it him and Ollie the other day, actually down at the mount with the surfboard, and I was like, mate... Neither of you for the gram, on, yeah, for the gram. Like, neither <laughs> are you getting up on that surfboard. Like, surely it's just a paddleboard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think there are too many surfers. But I think Hunty's a bit of a surfer. Yeah, um, down Dunners. Wouldn't know actually. Uh, unsure. unsure, unsure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you and I went for a wander around uh, to Tapu Ia. Tried to find a fellow. Yeah, that's right. We were waiting for uh, Toddy Dolan for an hour, though, weren't we? Yeah, that was after I turned up an hour late. So, um, yeah, no, that cut into our morning. I had a big night the night before and severely hungover. Yeah, um, and we waited for Toddy, and Toddy Dolan never showed. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That was all right. Um, that was a while ago now. Shit, was that? That would have been about five years ago. Uh, what am I now, 24? Would have been 19? 18, even. I think, it was, yeah. I think it was your first season out. A good five or six years ago then. Shit, yeah. It was, I remember that, though. It was, <laughs> it was a good stroll. Yeah. Good stroll through the bush. <laughs> <laughs> good, good way to sweat out the night before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shit, yeah. I paid that first couple of hours of that walk, that's for sure. I was not well. I was just hands on the knees in a couple of corners just waiting to get one out. But. It, was, it was just lucky I'd been there before and got completely lost because um, I got to see quite a fair amount of that block that first time I went in there so when the second time we went in there I was like oh we're gonna go there and I guess we can walk along here and it turned out alright so <laughs> yeah yeah no, nah, it was all good if I went there by myself mate I was not coming out eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. so no nah, that was a good walk yeah. it was um, yeah unfortunately didn't see anything but um, you know you, you, you used to head up to Mira a little bit though eh yeah yeah went up oh I've been up there a couple of times and then also down Puru Doors um, yeah been down down into the hut there for a few overnighters uh, with me wee cousin and um, yeah but um, where, was, where else did I go down um, oh I had a wee farm a couple of mates farms down like Arapuni way and um, sure, what's the place on the other side of the bridge there um, go over, from Arapuni head over the bridge hang a left nah you're telling me mate oh, well <laughs> I'm trying to I just can't <laughs> yeah a couple of farms down there we've picked up a couple on the on the back of the bush but yeah, no, I haven't had, haven't actually shot anything in the bush as such yet. So, yeah, yeah. yeah but been a while since been out. So, yeah. yeah. And like all the boys chase pigs down. down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a few of the boys take, chase the pigs, but actually uh, a couple of the guys just went out uh, last weekend actually, or last week. Um, Nanky shot a wee wee spiker actually down, they're down Christchurch way, and I think it was him, Hunty, Davy, and Red or something were out and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nice wee shots or a wee video of that. So uh, yeah, there's a few of the boys do get out for for a wee uh, deer hunt down there. But um, been out for a couple. But yeah, no luck down there with a few of the club boys down there. But yeah. geez, you've got a little, quite a lot of Hotapu connections there. In, in yeah, there is a yeah, um, young Alex Nankivall. Yeah, yeah, he's a good how tap man. And uh, yeah, myself, him and Chucky. Like you know, when we played that Waikato game, there was a lot of how tap boys on that field. Like. Mm-hmm. And even a couple of Helltap boys that weren't there. It was, um, you know, it's good for the club. Good to see, eh? So yeah. So how did you end up there? Like, obviously, Surf wasn't playing that first season, but you mean at Helltap? Yeah, just um, from St Peter's, or what was the game? Yeah, just just connection from St Peter's, really. So um, I played a handful of games for uh, Toke Surf when I was still at school. So I'd play like a school game on the Friday, and then <laughs> I'd roll like <laughs> the first time I'd actually just rolled up to watch the Surf guys on the Saturday and. I still had my rugby bag. I would just just been picked up from uh, from the bus stop on the way back from I think it was a Rathkill or something like that down Masterton ways. We played them on a Friday and come back on the bus and the old man had we, we'd gone down to watch the seniors play and then um, you yeah, got roped into playing um, a game there and you know bodies to waken and then from there ended up playing uh, must have been four or five games for them four games or something yeah 
Um, Did they just give you a dispensation or just nobody asked? Or? <laughs> nobody asked. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's toke. So, um, yeah, and played a few games. I actually had, um, had a game against uh, Subbers and played against Ben Tamiafuna. Um, so that was, uh, shit, that was funny, eh? Um, you know, I, I looked up to him as a kid even when I was at school and, and stuff and, you know, he's a bit of a beast and, yeah, when I heard he wasn't playing for Chiefs that weekend coming back from injury and played a game for Suburbs and... Because um, that would have been Div 1, right? Yeah, yeah, Div yeah. 1. So it wasn't Prems, just Div 1. Yeah. And, um, and, yeah, he turned up five minutes for the game, like, no warm-up, just boots on straight onto the field and just hisses, eh? And, um, yeah, I think he played 80 minutes or he had a wee break in the middle there somewhere. Um, and then um, did he play prop or did he play like number eight? No, nah, yeah, he played prop. He played tight head, and I played loose head. And um, oh, wow. so I had a few scrums against him at the end, day, But he was just toying with me. He's playing games like he was just sitting on me basically. And if he wanted to go, he could have gone and mm. you know uh, given me one. But um, yeah, and then um, the next day we actually had our Chiefs under 18s camp, <laughs> and uh, and he and he was coaching the the four uh, the props doing scrum tech stuff with us. So yeah, um, yeah, when he rolled up and he. So, what the fuck are you here? I saw you yesterday. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty funny, eh? You're like, um, yeah, I'm a school kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm still a school mate, like, you know, relax. But um, so that was pretty funny, eh? But um, no, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. And yeah, had a good time at Toke there. And then, yeah, just through St. Peter's connections, he ended up at Haltep, really. Like, it's kind of, we'd, we'd go down and watch our Haltep guys. Yeah. Um, play after we played our school game and stuff like that and support them. And then, yeah, heaps of the guys were going there. And so, you know, you know, for your mates going there, it's often often when you'll go. So, so is that Keddy? Yeah, Sam Kidd. Who else was going there? Um, DJ was going there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and then a few guys from the year before were there as well. Um, so and then yeah, quite a few. And Dougie was coaching there a wee bit as well, I think. Yeah, Andrew Douglas. Um, so he's helping out there a bit, and yeah. So no, it was all good. But just you know, love watching them play. So I was just uh, easy being up in Hamilton. Don't have to, like, as opposed to tote driving back and training yeah. and playing, it's a bit of a hassle. But hopefully, uh, don the colours for probably both teams, hopefully, again sometime in the future. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, nice, nice. So, you said like Ben came along and gave you a few pointers. Um, looking back on under 18 <laughs> propping, like, how much have you learned and where do, where's the main learning of being a prop? <laughs> Jeez, I don't know where to start with that, mate. Yeah. Um, that's like that's probably like teaching out a baby to walk, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, nah. So were you a baby at eighteen? Do you think? Yeah, I was still a baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, didn't have a moustache at <laughs> oh, We went out. I, I had one, but was wasn't allowed one. You know, at school, St. Yeah. Peter's pretty strict shaving rules there. Um, no, I don't know. Like, I think a lot of work that we did at that camp. I remember we did a lot of setup work. So like. Um, just just basically on balance and and your setup process and stuff like that like finding finding a process that works for you like you know just basically more so mental cues to like so that you're ready to scrum and so that by the time you get to like bind or mm-hmm. um, shit I don't know if we're at bind at that stage it might have still been <laughs> no nah, it must have been crouch bind pause engage or something I don't know yeah um, but like basically by the time you get to bind you know you're ready to scrum and you're, you've actually almost already won the scrum before you you actually engage. Mm-hmm. Like you've manipulated your opposition just in the crouch and bind process, so that you so out. that you've already got an upper hand basically. So just yeah, just finding a process that works for you and kind of you know, and then from there once you've got a process, then you then you adjust that and change that as you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that was one thing that I you know ticked off at, at that at that camp that week and uh, yeah just built on that from there so yeah it's a dark arts eh like I remember even Kurt Eklund before he was playing for Auckland when we used to play sevens against each other he'd get in the scrum and he'd just move his head like the slightest or move his shoulder just the slightest and he'd just turn you around and I'm like what are you, what are you even doing and then playing at Christchurch Tim mm. Berry I don't know why was picking <laughs> picking against him but he, he was the same thing he just like moved his moved an ear moved his jaw and I was like what yeah. is what is going on <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot more to it eh, than just like fold in and just hit each other and go for it like so is there like um, like you see the scrum set on the TV especially if there's spider cam or something and it looks like it's pretty solid like it's not moving but is there just like a whole bunch of torsional force going on yeah basically like you're you're absolutely like you know you get to the stage in a scrum sometimes where 
your eyeballs are just about to pop out like you've got like blood vessels bursting <laughs> and stuff like you know like i think i had a couple of scrums my second year at tassie maybe and um against uh, might have been against like tyrell or something like that and you know and you're, you're honestly like popping blood vessels and stuff like and you're almost fainting in the scrum because you're just pushing that hard and yeah there's that much tension and you you're, you're you don't actually like breathe as such when you're when you're in the scrum you're almost holding your breath for that whole time and um you know like even though sometimes it's like looks like a whole stale mate like yeah you're, you're pushing your guts out and they're pushing their guts out it's like when you get caught at the bottom of a squat and squat rack or something and you just can't move it like it's that kind of feeling like you're trying as hard as you can to move that weight but it's just not moving mm-hmm. so it's just like that for a good five sometimes ten seconds but yeah yeah on the breath i wonder what um I wonder what sort of secrets uh nigel beach has given cody taylor there's the is the hooker under the same sort of force yeah pretty similar yeah um not quite the same but pretty similar been a while since i played hooker to be found <laughs> except for a club and that's you know that, that's club but um yeah they're under like obviously a lot of the time sometimes you'll see especially when playing playing against um the likes of, like south africa and stuff like they'll try and stand your hooker up and and whatnot and so like a, a lot so of that's time, two but, props pinning or the prop and hooker pinning uh it's often the tight head and the hooker pinning the hook uh pinning the opposition hooker yeah and so like you know he get put under that much pressure that he has to lift his head out of the scrum and you'll see him stand up and and you know he's the one standing up and the props are like then stand up after kind of thing just because there's that much pressure going on he's got no other option otherwise you'll you know bend in half mm. um so yeah they're, they're quite often under a fair bit of heat as well and they actually do like you know most of the manipulating in the scrum mm-hmm. um, being in the middle of, middle of it and you know it's pretty hard to have a good scrum without a good hooker like yes yeah, you know massive part and of the both, game, both so. locks are going through him do we yeah 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 so yeah. they got a hook that's got two they're, lock they're, shoulders on them they're, yeah because they're, they're bound to you guys eh? and yeah so locks head between obviously the hooker and the prop on both sides so they got a shoulder on yeah the hooker and the prop on each side so yeah <laughs> Yeah, but I hate it in the era. Yeah, no, I did, did not really get introduced to that playing Northern Rivers lock. That was, that was the most hilarious thing when we went to Australia, eh? After standing around the locks of Sam Geard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. getting over to Australia, the coach being like, oh, every good flank is a good lock. And I was just like, are you talking about me? Six foot. And then I went and stood in the huddle, and then I was like, oh, now I see what you're talking about. Like, no one was taller. Really? And so I had to play lock. Oh shit! I think it's just because I knew how to jump, and that I wasn't even that good at jumping. <laughs> well, you had a few good jumping options at How Tap there. You know, you're always a safe option there. You can always get off the deck, and I can trust that you ain't going to give me one in the old ghoulies. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, well, that took a lot of learning. I think uh, nothing I think... worse, eh? absolutely nothing worse <laughs> as a prop like lifting a lock, especially a young lock, or even a loose that hasn't jumped before and their leg just comes flying back at you or kicks you in the in the bloody nuts. And oh. yeah. Now, I made sure I watched plenty of, uh, like, Sam Whitelock rugby coaching videos, and uh, Victor Matfield had, had a really good series on, on jumping. Yeah, and it was just like, pat, you know, you're talking about like that rebound force off your ankles, powering off the ground. That was yeah, the same yeah, thing, yeah. like, jumping straight up. Yeah, so by the, by the time uh, you got to lift me, mate, I <laughs> refined it a little. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. studying, so... That's pretty hilarious that you're a genuine lock over an Aussie, though. Like, oh, just, mate, a, just six in the foot n- tallest in the <laughs> <laughs> Just in Northern Rivers, eh? It's, it's a sketchy competition, um, not helped by some rather sketchy referees, which, as you know, I, I love sketchy referees. They're, they're my favourite types of people. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You know, I'd like to say the same, but 99% of the time they're not on my side, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, how, how have you found that element like um, when it gets pretty serious you know pr- provincial stuff keeping your mouth shut <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard sometimes you know I like to have a bit of yarn on the field sometimes whether it's you know with the old prop having a wee laugh or with the ref like, I'm pretty I don't know I switch in and out quite a lot on the field like you know basically when the whistle's gone and time's off whatever mm-hmm. you know you, you almost switch off a little bit um, and you know give yourself that mental break and lighten up a little bit and yeah. sometimes I have a little laugh or whatever and whatnot but yeah um yeah no nah, sometimes you just need to shut up and get to work eh? like, <laughs> it's um especially in the in your younger years it's um you yeah, know it's something you need to learn pretty quickly sometimes eh? <laughs> pretty <laughs> so funny though so, so you said to me about going to live with ethan um d- did you have much to do with lashy while you were down there yeah yeah so i oh when was it i think i met him 
met Lasher when he was living with Ethan Black at a, in my first year down there I think it was they were flatting together and um, and so I just naturally met um, Lashy that way um, and then he was involved with us a little bit like kind of he'd come and ref our trainings and stuff like that sometimes and help yep. out there a little bit and so um, got to know him he's a good bastard eh? he's good value so um, yeah and then he's obviously probably the best local uh, local referee and um, done a bit of Moda 10 over in America and obviously club comp for multiple years down in Nelson so mm-hmm. um, yeah but you know you can always have a bit of a joke with him on the field but sometimes you just need to shut up as well otherwise <laughs> he just keeps picking you yeah um, so yeah and I, and I suppose like as as the front row you do engage a lot with with the referee especially if the scrum's being reset or whatever you know there's three three of you on each side with an opinion of what went wrong and, and then the guy yeah. that the guy with the whistle um, <laughs> how, do, how does how do you sort of hold your tongue on that oh no I don't know you just got to try and get the ref on your side at the start eh? kind of when you when the ref comes in the chasing sheds and gets front rows together because yeah, you, get, you like get an opportunity before the game eh? <laughs> yeah 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 so I don't know sometimes you like always, you know, you always shake their hand and say, you know, g'day, whatever their name is, like Lashy or whatever, and have we yarn to them or whatever. If it's if it's club, you can often have a yarn to them beforehand, and you know, pretty lot chat or you know, might have then um, you don't say a hell of a lot, but um, yeah, I don't know you try and have a joke here or there every now, now and again, and just you know, try, try and be the lighter fellow a yep. lot and get them on your side, not yeah. be too serious, but yeah. nice, nice. So, do you have a mentor? A mentor? Not really, nah. No. Um, I've had, well, coming through Tassie, I had Tim Perry and White Crockett there for a couple oh, of years. Wow. So, yeah. fuck, you can't really ask for two, like two better blokes to, you know, be like, well, you can, but, um, <laughs> like, you know, I didn't get fuck all game time, but, um, no, nah, it was all right. It was all good. So, I had both of them over a couple of years. Like, there was me and Crocky is basically playing loose head uh, for a couple of years there while he was there, and then Tim Perry as well when he, come back from ABs and played a few games or coming back from injury there um, so you know I kind of looked up to both of them for, for the last wee while and um, had them there what was that um, both of them finished up 20 oh, what are we now 2019 I think they both finished up after we won the mm-hmm. won the premiership down in Nelson there so had them for, especially for those years of 2018 and 2019 was pretty special so you know always kind of looked up to Crocky as a kid when he was when he was scrumming him and uh, Tony Woodcock were you know like the two goats at, mm-hmm. um, of the time and did an absolute job um, so yeah they were kind of like you know your idols almost but haven't really had a, a proper mentor as such coming up but you know yeah, so what did you get out of playing with it? well playing under them shit I don't know you just kind of you don't really ask them too many questions you just kind of just watch and observe what they do eh? like you know, you, you don't go up and nag them all the time, whatever, like, it's just weird, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like be that little kid, whatever, eh? like, fanboy, but nah, um, you just kind of, like, watch and observe what they do and how they go about their business and their process, and, um, yeah, I know, I, like, from Crocky as such, I got, got a lot around just his process and how he, like, his composure and scrum time and basically just how he prepares himself, like, mentally for a scrum, like, you know, like when he's packing down, he's 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 packing down to basically dominating, like you know, go to war mm-hmm. um, with the opposition um, as such. And like I don't know, you just kind of you kind of see it, eh? And um, yeah, just kind of in and around that, and his composure around it all. Like he's just an absolute beast. And like that man got in some ugly positions, but shit, he can scrum out of the mail. Like mm-hmm. yeah, oh, I don't know. Like it's pretty funny. Like he, he wouldn't gym as such. Once you start getting on in age, you kind of don't lift the big weights in the mm. gym all the time and stuff like that you don't really kind of need to and you just don't kind of do it And but shit that man can just turn up and just hone out anyone eh? like mm-hmm. fuck, it was wicked so um, yeah kind of just being behind them and learning their process and how they go about business and you know getting a few pointers and stuff like that on the scrum sled after training each day and stuff was, was bloody helpful on the whole way eh? so yeah. gone away in, in terms of my career and my scrum sort of thing so yeah and so, like on the, on the scrub and sled, is that just basically the biomechanics? Like, you know, put that in, put that foot slightly forward, bend that knee slightly more, drop that hip, lift that hip. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like as a whole, yeah. That f- you know, for people that uh, from the outside looking in, yeah, basically, kind of that's that's all it is. So, on the scrub sled, which is just a single man scrub machine, basically, and you know, you'll go, you'll do a crouch bind uh, set on that and 
from that where the camera's out like the ipad's out and you'll watch you'll kind of see where you fire from because mm-hmm. sometimes it's uh, often easy for um, a bad habit to get into is when you're basically firing from your glutes as such or from your ass and your, your ass is coming up mm. when you fire and you want to be whereas you want to be firing straight through yep. um, so basically from the knees your knees should be going forward kind of thing um, as such when, when you're like on a set um, into the scrum scrum sled and just helping you out with your setup and basically your process and just the whole the whole shebang but you know you'd micro down all those details mm-hmm. after training on scrum sleds so um, and they're pretty helpful in that regard so yeah and and how related like you said you're getting back into running technique how um, how much does those sort of lines of movement and, and things carry over into scrum or is it just completely different it's a fi- um, sort of sick, fixed position but you want to be moving forward <laughs> same same but different um, well yeah if if my well, I'm not a big big scrummager like it's not like my forte but what well, is, but it's not like you know my um, what would you call it? Um, you know the one thing I can do around the field, like. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, shit, I don't know. I re- I wish that everything I did in the scrum just translated to my run tip because then I could be could actually be fast. But <laughs> you know, at, at, at the moment, um, and like, like you know, I'm I'm not the fastest guy, but you know, you, you get there. Yeah, you get there in your own time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, it relates a little bit in terms of. And around your calf work and mobility, like you know, you got to be pretty like have real good like ankle, calf, knee mobility in the scrum, like because ultimately the more sprigs you can have on the on the ground, you know, the more you can push through mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and um, transfer your your force going forward. So um, yeah, at the moment going through all my run tech stuff, like that's that's just gonna basically transfer back into my scrum stuff when I get back. So um, yeah, especially the calf raises and. the a marches and your bloody toe taps and all that so um yeah no nah. was there any concern for compartment syndrome with with that fracture what do you mean what's that so i think like the fascia gets really tight and kind of strangles the muscle within within the compartment yeah, i don't no. don't think so no that's no. good <laughs> well have, haven't been told yet anyway no, we'll, we'll yeah. find out if it happens or, uh, no i, I think, imagine it would hurt a wee bit but. yeah i think it's just like a consequence of uh, what can happen if you get a bad fracture in a muscle group like that mm. yeah I remember uh, young Bobby Dowling um, world world lumberjack champion he, he had a bit of issue with that he was, he was playing prop for a while down there in Dunedin but oh yeah gave, yeah. gave in the rugby to chase the lumberjack dream <laughs> get that <laughs> still <Jeez>. sponsorship yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. to a tap his finest yeah yeah, yeah. so um, you said about like the scrum not necessarily what you'd known for like What's what's the energy system like? In a, in do you, do you go eighty minutes very often? Uh, no. no, 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 no. Uh, well, not in a professional scene like club rugby is a little bit different. Like yeah, you know you can sometimes battle away for eighty minutes, but nah, like oh, you get a few guys that can play eighty minutes when when asked or when needed to. Say in the professional scene, like especially in Mod Ten Cup, like. Um, is that's why there's four props now. Eh? Yeah, yeah. That's why you've got you know basically a, a whole nother scrum on the on the bench, like a whole nother front row. So, um, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't remember the last time I really played eighty minutes. Apart from, well, I've never played more than seventy. I think it is um, on a professional scene. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've usually come off the wood most most times, um, both for minor ten and for super. Um, but yeah, you get you do, you do see a few guys, the uh, the fitter guys that that can go eighty, um, like your yeah, Marcel Renitzers, Alex Hodgman, yeah. like that. Probably the only two that that stand out Marcel. to me. Um, <laughs> He's good, good lad. Yeah, He's got sure. a great moustache too. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> and prob- mullet. It topp- <laughs> topples me a wee bit. Eh? I think it, I, I think <laughs> I need to like dye it. You know? <laughs> it this is quite black. It's like you know, it just stands out. It looks real good. Um, the tattoos. Oh, he's, he's, a, he's a handsome man. We used to call him Maui, eh? Maui. Jeez. Yeah, king of the ocean. Um, but um, yeah, no, you don't see too many guys. But there are probably a couple that stand out that I can that come to the top of my head that can you know go the distance. But um, yeah, most of the time props will go anything from fifty to sixty minutes kind of thing. Like play the play the first half. You usually blowing your ring out coming at, <laughs> coming at half time and get a bit of a you know uh, so what's the scrum like at uh, 41 minutes what's what's that like no nah, it's actually not too bad you, you're kind of you're in the game like as in you're you're warmed up like you've, you've already packed down you know three four maybe five scrums in the first half and um, 
by the time you get the second half, you're quite fresh. I like, know. Oh, I mean, like, yeah, the, the first half's dragging. <laughs> oh, like, oh, end of the first half. Like, yeah. you're going overtime first half kind of material. Oh, yeah, no, you're, you're usually blowing one, eh? Like, um, depends if you get your second wind in the first half or you okay. get it in the second half. Like, if you get your second wind late in the first half, then, you know, you're usually all right. Um, but, so there must be a few mind, mind games going on if, if that becomes a situation right yeah, yeah. Dep- <laughs> looking at each other in the eye like you really <laughs> yeah depends who you're up against as well eh? like if you're up against some of those fitter buggers then you know what the other ones are eyeballing you and you're kind of just like oh shit but no no, <laughs> no, no. Um, like you know you turn up to every scrum doesn't matter how how bugged you are and you're just ready to go to work like you, mm. you know you, you can't be too tired to scrum like mm-hmm. it's it's your job and that's what you're there for and you know, if you are, you get found out pretty quickly most of the time, eh? And, you know, sometimes it just results in the ref blowing his whistle because you're getting pumped five metres back towards your own line. So, um, yeah, now you've always got to be ready to scrum, eh? But, yeah, I don't know, you, you get a few, especially late in the piece, like, you know, even if you come off the wood and you're coming on at 50 minutes and then you get into the 80, 83, 84 minute mark or something like that. And especially because those last 30 will be game. usually a bit more open game as well though, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty you know, pretty high pace and um, pretty fast footy but it, like, you know, the best thing is if you're one of the first subs on then when all the other subs come on there's a bit of time off so it's like pretty stop starty for, yeah, for okay. a period there yeah, and yeah. that last kind of 10 or 15 minutes is usually like, like pretty high pace and all the subs are on injuries, you know, rowdy row it's all gone like, so that last 15 10 or 15 minutes you pretty quick eh and um, if it if it has been two stop starty, then you'll get a second wind in yep. and around that time, and you'll be all right. But yeah, shit, if it's two stop starty, you won't get a second wind, and you can just be heaving the big ones pretty quickly, because eh, you're trying to do everything. You're fresh off the bench, or so called, and yeah, tr- you know, try and be the impact player. Still, fifteen twenty minutes in, but yeah, how how good's playing with structure in like modern ten? Oh <laughs> mate, it's so nice. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking about say say it's thirty five minute scrum. Yeah, you're breathing out your eyeballs and then you've got to do the scrum you're, you're blowing out your eyeballs and then you've got to get your head up and go where's my position oh, like, how yeah. good's it going I stand there <laughs> yeah like oh, it's so good being able to play with proper structure and people that you know that, that can do their job I'm not saying that people don't at club rugby but like you know sometimes you've you've got to be able to do somebody else's job if if they can't do it or it's not done like you know like if someone's gone to the wrong position or missed a clean out and you have then got to go like yeah, you know, go fuck. in ten meters and clean a rack or whatever. And, but like in my ten cup, you can trust trust you know all all other fourteen guys on the field that they're going to do their job. And so you know you can stand up from a scrum and know where you have to go, and that's all you have to worry about as such. Like mm-hmm. obviously, if like or for me as a prop, but you know halfbacks first size they worry about, but more than that. But yeah, for me as a prop, like you know I know like you know we'll, we'll call our play or whatever, and I know where I've got to be and. Um, best thing being down in Tasman half time I you know ball going to the line out first phase second phase and I'm just pulling up on the, basically on the open side get, you know kind of you can almost walk to your position almost kind of <laughs> thing and it's so you get a bit of a breather along the way sometimes if you have been having a few but um yeah oh it's so good being able to play a structure and then being able to just watch it all unfold and know know when you're going to make a line break kind of thing like you know you play structure to to exploit teams not necessarily first phase like you have like you know so called specials and plays to be able to exploit teams first phase but you know through your structure you, you know it's four or five sometimes six phases where you know you'll hang teams out to dry and, mm. and you know break them down then so but yeah so nice compared to and so is that where you like you get you know you watch a game of high, high first class rugby we'll call it first class rugby might have 10 and up and, and you see the structure and it looks fast but because um, each portion of the structure is only playing at one point in time do you get that chance to recover better or not nah? sometimes, <laughs> um, sometimes it's kind of yeah a little bit like like say set plays like you know a line out 30 or 40 meters out from their line like attacking line out like that's that's when you're playing basically full structure or like anything pressing up like it's just the broken players usually when you like you get caught out as a front row because you're running back and forth and balls just getting kicked back and forth and then someone makes a line break and then you're having to get back you know in behind your D line and then 
and then you get a turnover and then your guys kick it then you're chasing up the field you know that broken play that's the stuff that'll really get you those kick return rules are gnarly on you guys eh yeah they are eh get the hell out of that 10 metres (laughs) that's why they're putting out those big sky bombs eh yeah you know (laughs) to just punish you guys running around in circles yeah yeah. 10 metre circles you know you just about gotta make your halfbacks buy you a coffee if they don't get it outside that 10 metre eh because you you know um, oh you know it's a good rule it, well I don't know if it is or not but it's you know it's there for a reason and, well it is a good rule because if the person can get the take they, they've got that 10 metres to try and open some space up yeah yeah, yeah exactly so and if you got, if you guys are lazy then you're basically out of a, out of a game eh? yeah 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 in some respects but you know you don't have too many kicks that are in, inside that 10 metres in a game it's kind of just a missed kick from a from a half kick, uh, half back on a box kick or something like that usually mm. but um yeah, like I love that broken play and kind of that fast ball, especially like say you get a turnover or you know one of your backs make a line break on a on a kick return or something like that, and um, and then you you just you play rugby instead of like structure or such. You have a structure within a structure, but mm-hmm. you just kind of play rugby eh? and like you just hit holes when you see them and you just like you know offload it when it's on and stuff like that. And like that's like, that's some of the best rugby is you know mm-hmm. that open play. You'll still have that back, backhand it. flick pass, Coxie. Oh, I've always had it, mate. Had it. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm saying. It's still there. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Is it? You're the one that like watches the footy. Like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah when, when, when you saw Bodie do that ball to um, Luke, you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah same, same, eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can run 34 k's an hour as well, like, same, same, but oh. uh, not quite. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, now you try and keep keep a bit of that in your arsenal, mate. And <laughs> practice those wee things like you know when nobody's watching, you know, down at the gym or something like that. Because yeah, uh, yeah no. Nah, we'll we'll see your line out throwing as well. That, that's that's another one of your back back pocket tricks. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when there's two yellow cards, when both hookers get carded, eh, you need someone to throw the ball in. I suppose. So, <laughs> no, nah, yeah, from from the old hooker days, you know, um, played a bit in club the last couple of years. Every now and again as well, when mm-hmm. when you needed, but. Um, yeah, no, never shy of throwing a hooker ball in when when you needed, mate. Well, yeah. you know, but yeah, first job's first. You got to scrum, eh? Yeah. So, <laughs> so okay, you, you got to scrum. You're a prop. It's on the it's on the job description. What's your favourite part of the game? Probably what I said before, like the broken play, like just when you when you're able to play rugby, like free flowing, like yeah. Um, love being able to have ball in hand and ball carry, or even just smashing rucks, like you know, it's all pretty good. Um, I don't know. Is that, is that why the open play is better? Because you might have the old person standing there that you get to line up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes you get like someone who just like because well they arrive they arrive in a shit position, eh? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> but kind of. Probably more so because the whole team like you're making game line every time, mm-hmm. and so everything you're doing you're running on to it. Everything's at pace, and so you're always moving at high pace. And then as soon as like someone's able to get either a hit on the ball or something to get a jackal and then you can just come flying in and smoke them or if they're in, especially if they're in a shit position or something like that but um yeah i don't know but also yeah i love jackling as well like, i love the d side of things like the, mm-hmm. the challenge on defense is you know being able to just keep teams out and find a way to turn the ball over like no, so your jacko is an arriver or are you a tackle spring to the feet top top of man no nah, i'm a arriver <laughs> like hey i'm fast off the ground i a pretty good burpee but like <laughs> like like don't get me going for repetitions you know like yeah, that's just, often that's often what the case is on the rugby field like you know you're not doing 10 in a row right there and then but yeah you know it's uh on repeat but now i'm first arriving player kind of kind of jackler and waiting for those opportunities and you kind of just try and read the play and anticipate what's happening usually and yeah um try and pick your moments there when you can so yeah and right. just get into a strong position and stay strong over the ball if you can but um, yeah, the new pulling pulling rule now with um, in the Modern Modern Cup just been as um, was was a pretty good rule way about then. So what what, it's what a little they bit have to So instead of kind of just being able to get your head on the ball as such and get over it in a strong. Oh, position, you actually had to pick it up. Eh? You, you actually had to show the ref that you're trying to pull the ball up. Yeah. Um, otherwise, he actually penalises you if you're not trying to pull the ball. Yeah. And you're and you're say off your feet or anything like that, you get pinged, but. If um, you, you've just got to show that you're pulling the ball, mm-hmm. um, trying to turn it over as such for your team to then play. Um, so that's basically a new rule that kind of came. Well, what would you call it? Rule or interpretation? Interpretation is probably the way to put it. Eh? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Like obviously, it's probably just going to be adjusted slightly, maybe over over the next season or two, and till it's refined. Maybe in terms of just the time that the refs refs have to see it to then give it, rather than 
mm-hmm. give it straight away but yeah so so do you have an opportunity to learn that before the season or yeah yeah so um when that interpretation kind of came in we like we, we talk about it as a team and what what you can and can't do in terms of like trying to win a penalty or why you might get penalized and like we'll get like sometimes we even get a ref in to kind of explain that or even at training and get them to explain that a bit more at training for for us right at the start of the season so that you know everyone's clear on you know what's expected so mm-hmm, yeah mm-hmm. um so you kind of get a pretty good understanding of it pretty quickly what's what's your element in pre-season what do you mean like the bronco obviously oh yeah absolutely. <laughs> love a good bronco <laughs> what's, your, what's your plan bro uh, <laughs> <laughs> survive uh, yeah no nah, with a bronco mate like anyone that's done a bronco shit yeah, uh, <laughs> where does it, where does it hit? Survive, where like, does it hit you, mate? Is it the lungs or the lower back? <laughs> uh, probably the shoulders. Just trying to carry the whole team, eh? No, no, is that because you're at it, the back? It, uh, no, no, carry the team, mate. You're at the front. You're, oh, okay. you're no, 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 I'm always at the back. No, not quite, but I, I, I like to come from the back and pass everyone on the last bit. So I'm often last Bring it for home. the few. Yeah, last for the few, first few reps because everyone goes out hot. I did that, and like I've done that a few times, and I've bu- I've burnt out way too quick. Like you're trying to keep up with everyone else on those first, like you know. So everyone that doesn't know what a bronco is, you you do you go twenty meter, forty meter, sixty meter, and then you do that five times. Mm. Um, I think it's one point two four k. I think it is. Yeah. I can't remember. And in speaking, total, but, speaking of bodies, um, like four fifteen, right? Yeah, something like that. It was ridiculous, yeah. but um, did you know, twenty? Did you? Yeah, maybe even nineteen. That was with, oh. that was with Sam Dixon. Jesus, that was good fun. You must have been on a short field. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro. No. So, no, Sam, Sam that's, that's was good stuff, mate. Sam was that's back um, with, with us um, for that was at Rugby Park in Christchurch, and he was back training with us before. So it was yeah the week before we came up to Tauranga to do the Mount Sevens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had a fitness test. Yeah, after coming back from New Year's, so. it's wicked, man. Yeah, it's wicked. No, I can't say I've <laughs> done that before, but yeah, um, no, nah, the lungs definitely hurt a lot, and the legs lot. It's just legs and lungs lot. It just ruins your a lot. Mm. From the first rep, you're feeling it kind of thing, and you just got to stay in it. Like you just go hard and just got to stay in the fight. Like those last like that last rep going 20, 40, 60 on that last rep that's what your legs are about to fall off eh um, nothing like the taste of blood eh yeah yeah, yeah literally and uh, the sweat just running into your eyes as you go but no, nah, it's all good stuff mate um, it's, you know good way to start start the day sometimes um, start the training day in pre-season mm. um, so yeah but been a while since I've done one actually so yeah um, no doubt I'll be doing a few of them when I'm back from injury you're benchmarking um, yeah I don't know I like, can't really make a target yet till I'm back running but yeah I've kind of I think PB's 504 or 505 nice um, you know not too bad for a front row but yeah um, I know like recent- you wouldn't quite make the sevens team mate you've got to get below I think five, uh, 445 mate I'm pretty sure there's no 121 kilo sevens players so that that's all good like, have I'm, you seen I'm the Fiji and Olympic team yeah I'm pretty sure they're massive but I don't know if they like, they, they can't scrum can they like, no, yeah. no they can Like what, what, watching them they can scrum but maybe not with another five or six guys behind them yeah. Um, but yeah there's some units in there eh? um, that Fiji team was unbelievable yeah Oh, I, so good. Uh, it was a bit like last week um, we were talking about Ireland beating New Zealand. I was like, oh, I'm not angry about it. And that was just, that was a little bit the same. Like, obviously, I wanted the boys to win in, mm. in the Simmons final, but watching that game, I was especially those three plays they made in the first half off their long kickoff. I was like, oh, well, they've, they've showed up and they've won this game. That was yeah, that yeah. was outrageous. Yeah, and especially when oh, I don't know his name, but old mate went down the right hand touchline and bumped. Um, he was he was played with you. Uh, one of the Simmons boys. Simmons boys. Uh, yeah, what one? There's a couple. Andrew Newster. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tony yeah. Issue. Newster. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He tried. To, he tried to like. He just ran full clip at him, tried to get him over the touchline, and yeah. <laughs> Newster just got booked. I was like, oh well. <laughs> yeah, I think he ended up grabbing his ankles in the end. He got like absolutely rolled, but he grabbed his ankles eh, as he fell on his back. I think. Like, yeah, I but think he, I remember that. Yeah, but he still managed to get. Get around him, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. outrageous. Ended up being uh, in the tournament team as well. Did old Stubby, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, from that, from from the Olympics, and then went on to be New Zealand Sevens Player of the Year as well. Hey? So yeah. even though he got bumped like hell in that, and, oh, wow. you know, it was the saw, final. It was the final. Yeah, yeah, probably saw a few stars. Like you know, <laughs> um, no, nah, he's 
he had a bloody good year. So, so Regan came and played with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regan came down as well. So Stubby and Regs that came down and played down in Tessie there. So um, that was that T- was T- bloody awesome. Hardcore. Man. Yeah, mate. Toke 886. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's a couple of us down there, which is good. Um, yeah, so a few boys ripping t- Toke numbers, though. So it's good, mate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously he grew up around, around these ways and then... Yeah, went on with his uh, footy career as well, and been yeah. all over the show. So, yeah. yeah. Um, how much? How much of a drawback is? Like, I've sort of um, had the lead of the YMCA here, and sort of you know, uh, see a few few of the kids from schools and stuff, and I sort of asked them, you know, what do you want to do? And mm. None of them seem to have much of an idea. Mm. You go into the council and. On the like I sent you that photo uh, on yeah, the yeah. on the council there, you know all, all the people, including Dallas Seymour as well, who um, he was coaching the women's Canterbury Sevens team when I was there. But like, sure. you know, you you look at something like that and think about all the people that come from the region, but it doesn't mm. seem to be the same sort of hopes and dreams coming out of the kids. So like, is there mu- much of a drawback? Does anyone sort of shoulder tap you, cocks you to say, come to the town and? show these kids what's possible <laughs> yeah I don't know obviously it's a little bit hard when I'm down in Nelson like, yeah, for basically sure. most of the time but you know I'd love to get back and um, you know see some of the old teachers I've still got a few teachers floating around that um, especially at Token Intermediate I think and I'm not sure if any are left at uh, Token North School but um, you know and go in and see them and talk to some of the kids and stuff like have we yarn but not that I know who I am anyway, like, you know, it's still, on, still a bit of a battler, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, I suppose when I was looking back as a kid, though, like, I didn't have many hopes and dreams and, like, wanted to be, like, a rugby player or anything like that, like, yeah. shit, I was just, I was just happy having fun at school and playing ball rush and stuff out on the field and then Miss Moon coming out and bloody ripping us a new one and sitting us up on the wall at Intermediate and stuff like that, but, um, yeah, no, nah, I don't know, like, I didn't have hopes and dreams of of that as a kid yeah. but like, I don't know I suppose it's whether it's like the township and stuff I don't know like yeah you, you get kids that just not worried about that they just go day to day you know yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. then but then you'll get some kids that, that, that are a bit like that and like oh, I want to be a rugby player like that's, yeah. that's like my one life aspiration or like, a lot know, of them whatever, a lot like, of them here I want to play in the NRL <laughs> yeah yeah play league yeah. Um, you know stuff like that so yeah no. what about the golf was that was that like I'm going to be Tiger Woods <laughs> not until later on um oh probably nah not really until I got to high school I think yeah start of high school but um you know like had a few dreams there um you know golf was was definitely an option yeah back in the day whether I could have made it or not I don't know who would know but um yeah no I loved both golf and rugby growing up um didn't start playing either of them till end of primary school like started intermediate so yeah um, I think it was about year six at primary school. I started, well, how old are you then? About 11. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So well, I didn't start playing both until I was about 11. So um, got got into both of them about then. I was, I was a little soccer fag before that. Um, is <laughs> nothing, wrong with with, with, nothing wrong with soccer football there, mate. <laughs> not at all. Love a good su- uh, summer soccer. Like, but, yeah. you know, apart from that life, you know. The diving the diving's really got to go. <laughs> no, that's yeah, that's not the one, eh? But, you know. <laughs> but a summer soccer down at the old Toke uh, Sports Grounds down here is always, always the one. Oh, nice. But, um, yeah, enjoyed that in the summer. That was good as a kid, but, yeah. Have you ever um, had a round with John Hardy? Mm. No. Who's that? Do I know? Uh, yeah, Should he, I know? He might have, he might have left Contra Scotland by, by that stage. So he used, he used to play flank of uh, Southland and, um, and the Hollanders. Oh, yeah. Same age as me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, then we went to Scotland and just played for Newcastle as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, he's a handy, handy golfer. Yeah, yeah. Who, uh, Damien McKenzie's pretty good, is he? Yeah, no, he's pretty handy. Him and, well, Anton thinks he's good, but. Um, yeah, is Anton any good? No, no, he's shit, mate. <laughs> Like the, the man can't find a fairway off the tee. Well, I know his vibe, but yeah, we, we were at the we were at the driving range the other day. It was just kind of like, oh well, I guess if I'm playing golf, I'll see you over that on that fairway. Yeah, <laughs> I'll yeah. play over there. Yeah, well, he, he sees a lot of the course, that's for sure. <laughs> um, he often has a big slice, and he's never been able to control it. But um, nah, yeah, Damo's pretty handy. Um, Brad Weber, Spud. Yeah, he's he's real handy actually. I think he. Shit, what's the new course up by Hamilton Airport? What's that called again? Uh, Taiki or something, whatever it is. The, no. Oh, it's a new international course that's just gone in up there. And 
yeah, a few of the boys whispered to me he had a pretty sharp round around there. So it's new international course has just gone in real un- like unreal. It's um, it was the Lockheed Golf Club and it's just been all fully transformed. Um, it's been closed for a couple of years, so that could be all redone. I think it opened up about a week or two ago, and I think he had a pretty sharp round around there the other day. Actually, maybe seventy four or seventy three or so. Um, so he's pretty sharp, and then um, the other boys up this way. Uh, Quinn Tupai, he goes alright, has a bit of fun. Luke Jacobson, he's, you yeah, know, um, he's stiffer than a hamstring on a cold morning. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no. Nah, but has he, he has he come in late to the party and just got got the vibe? Or oh, he's been playing a couple of years now, but he he goes alright. Like he, he actually he can hit a good ball, way. Eh? Yeah. Um, and he's yeah, no, nah, he's going bloody well now. Um, but yeah, when he first came, fuck it was. It was so Ryan, yeah, is it about your club selection, or do you actually need a bit of finesse? Uh, <laughs> judging, oh, just in, judging distances like off the tee obviously there's a lot to it like yeah oh even off the tee sometimes like club selection a wee bit but no oh, there's a lot to golf is i suppose in some respects there's almost more to golf than rugby in some way um then, then being like, a front row like, <laughs> yeah 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just like cabbage eh? um, the dark so, arts though um no i oh, don't know it's totally a different sport and for me like it's been a great way to kind of get away from rugby and just like think about something totally different eh? like, mm-hmm. it's a whole different challenge whole different aspect um, so as, yeah as you know I played a lot of golf and you know it's kind of like I'm an art between golf and rugby for a wee bit but like even now I still get out as much as I can or not literally at the moment with the old broken ankle so don't know when the return players for, for golf <laughs> uh, but um yeah, hopefully be back out. Back Do you out have to get that signed off? I uh, probably, probably, yeah, probably be a smart idea. I suppose um, rugby pays your bills, don't they? <laughs> yeah, it does most of the time. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, no, it's just a good way to get out there and about, and you know, like get off off the field with a few of the boys and like get out on a day off and go and play some golf and just talk about something other than rugby and mm-hmm. and whatnot, and then. Down in Tasmania, we've got a few good golfers down there as well. We've got David Arvilli, He goes pretty well. He's I think he's uh, off about eight or a nine, and same as Will mm. Jordan, mm. old Bill. He's um, he's pretty handy. And then we managed to get a few of the other boys into it in the last year or two as well. Actually, looking Alex Nangfall into a bit of golf, and Tim O'Malley, Finlay Christie, um, Mitch Hunt, um, Louis Chapman. He's pretty handy actually. We halfback. He can hit a big ball if he wants for a little man. Um, and then yeah, got a few other new guys, Antonio Shalfoon and um, yeah, Willie Arvelli, he plays a little bit as well. So we've got a pretty good crew down in Nelson actually that that play. So um, So yeah. what what's the tea times like? Usually oh we've been playing out at Green Acres Golf Club down there this year because in the past you couldn't really get out in Nelson until two in the afternoon on your day off. Like there's just people booked up all morning and so and then even if you could get on, it's like four hours down there. But uh, Green Acres Golf Club, wicked little golf club out out at uh, Richmond there, and um, they looked after the fellas well this year. And um, yeah, like we could get out basically any time after say eleven or mm-hmm. twelve o'clock, and went round and got a couple of golf carts, saved the legs. So um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's you know it takes three three and a half hours to play around. Sometimes this five or six year might take four hours, but yeah, so that's yeah. pretty good, eh? Pretty right. You played a bit of golf? Nah. Your time? Yeah, but not at all. Though. I I, I grew, grew up over the road from Otatara Golf Course down there in Invercargill. Mm. Used to um, hunt the hedges for balls, but... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. And then yeah. sell them on Trade Me or something? Yeah, you know what? No, no Trade Me then. It was like the old, <laughs> the old second-hand dealer, pawn shop. No, not oh, pawn shop, yeah. but yeah, second-hand yeah, yeah. dealer. Yeah, he had, you know, give you 10 cents a ball top. top yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're mostly just range balls, so yeah. they're all pretty shit. But. Oh, that's fine. Make a little bit of pocket money. Anyway, <laughs> pocket money, yeah, your $5. Yeah. So. Something to get a zombie chew down at the, down at the dairy <laughs> or something like that, or a well, can of coke. Or? Yeah, that's a problem with that Tara. The, the dairy was bloody a K away on a main road, so oh, no. no. Um, didn't really do the odds. Must have been a fit young lad, though. You'd run down the grass or something like that to go, go get a pack of lollies. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. No. Nah. Not, lollies weren't really really the thing. I don't know what we spent them on actually. Yeah, I can't even. I think. can tell that lollies weren't your thing, mate. But, <laughs> but your own bugger. That's definitely my thing, eh? Hence a change of rig. But <laughs> yeah, the old the old man, which well, the old lady on Sunday was asking me, "Are you going to do another ultra marathon, Ryan?" I was like, "Oh, I still there's still the idea of doing 100 k's." And the dad's like, "Ryan, you're not made for running." <laughs> so what are you talking about? I ran 54 k's, John. I was like, "Yeah, and how were your hips?" <laughs> yeah, still was that the longest you've run? 54? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> how, long, how long did that take you? Uh, seven hours, 
35 minutes and 42 seconds. Damn, man. It's just a long day. <laughs> it is a long day. It's, you know, that's almost literally a work day, you know? Yeah, I was pretty um, pleased I'd changed from the 101 Ks because... Is that what you're going to do? Uh, that was what I'd entered, yeah. And Shit. So... What you, happened then? Oh, uh, I re- went for a run about a month earlier. That was 46K and about 30Ks deep. It got pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. And so I thought, well, that, that's not a good idea. No, Because there's another 70Ks to go. <laughs> yeah. Far out. And you would, like, it was, it was probably the last, um, yeah, I got, I took a wrong turn with about 20Ks to go and that derailed oh, me a little bit. Shit. But I, I got back, back on the track, but yeah, it's, the hip, hip started to hurt. And then the last part was like Giddy's Pass, getting over onto the Christchurch side of the Port Hills and going around the Port Hills and then down a hill to the end. And yeah, yeah so it's not a flat run, eh? No, it wasn't. It was, yeah. So we, uh, what did we do? Started off, did a 400 metre hill pretty much straight away. And then over 21 k's we went from sea level all the way to the top. I can't remember what, excuse me, I can't remember what that hill was called, but yeah, over we ran 21 k's and, and went a thousand meters or just under a thousand meters elevation Far out. and then see so then you're sort of running along the top of this mountain and then you drop down quite a wee way and then up this thing called the bastard <laughs> <laughs> which is just shit i bet it was just yeah it was so i was calling it worse things than bastard that was for sure <laughs> and uh yeah then down the other side and into, into hallsville quarry and yeah she was pretty sore far out i imagine man. yeah the old patella tendons were balloons and just the old knee was just like grinding on top of them and oh, hips hips super tight is that the craziest thing you just about done what um you know like yeah it was like like compared, up there? compared to playing sevens like you get you know especially being a forward and and my downside was being six foot like we talked about rather than mm. six two six three um you know like scott carey or sam dixon and that sort of stuff yeah. um or even Nucky McCall, he was he was playing at centre, but you know he's he's a bit taller. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you still got the opportunity to go and lift weights and like be strong and try be a hundred kgs and mm. but also still run a good yo-yo and yeah, you yeah, know yeah. play a tournament and be fit and all that sort of stuff. So it was yeah. that was that in terms of energy systems that was probably like where I was in my element. But yeah, trying to run was just like a real mental thing, and I think the training was the best slash worst because yeah. it's kind of like um at first you start off with three runs a week and then it turned into four runs a week and then you're just like trying to find the time like i was <laughs> at one stage there i was running like a half marathon before work going to work i'd run like 5k's at lunchtime and then get home and run the last sort of well, i think 20 odd k's what, what would it need to be yeah like about 20. sure is that right yeah so you're you're running like 50k's across a day yeah. <laughs> oh that's commitment, man. That's yeah. commitment and running is one of those things you can't just tick off in an hour or something eh? like, yeah. you know, like, so well, you, to go and do normally, half, normally you can but if, you, if you're if you going to run that long then you do you need to run yeah. ridiculous amounts it's, Shit, yeah. it's silly yeah it's nuts where, where does the gym fit in pre-season is it just kind of like get get the on field stuff done and get in <laughs> no well, you often oh, I know it's usually best to try and gym first I reckon eh? like yeah. like it depends what team you're with and stuff or like say if you're on your own then you kind of make it work but so you'd be responsible for a bit of gym in the pre-season yeah yeah so like i'll be training on my own back for uh down at the wee uh, muscle and curves down there i'm training down there tote gym for next month are their bars straight (laughs) i'm not sure (laughs) because i was at gym 56 eh? there was a couple of good bars but a lot of them were they bent bent and oh. ruined <laughs> oh shit uh, I've been in there before I think um, gym 56 one or two times eh, when I was like well when I was back here and you know for a week or something like that but yeah no a um, couple of the fellas um, mentioned that you know that one wasn't too bad so yeah um, yeah so been down there but yeah on my own back for, for the next month or so so um, just working off my physio and like up in Hamilton so um, and just basically yeah, do it as I'm told there. So I got all programmed up for the next six weeks. And from then, your physio? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from Tasman. And then just any, in terms of ankle work and stuff like that, then that's kind of on top of that. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and yeah, running will just kind of fill into it. So as we go. But yeah, so hopefully back on the 
running field uh, the next end of next uh, this week um, starting next week so um, yeah around Christmas time be starting to run again so yeah that'd be nice but, and your yeah. bike tier how much have they been doing uh, literally that <laughs> fuck oh yeah <laughs> uh, no nah, we've so uh, that's kind of like my off feet conditioning so um, that's what I've kind of been doing at the gym for your feet conditioning so that you can't go for a run and get your heart rate up like that's it's kind of what you do that ski erg bit of boxing so um, that's what I've been up to the last couple of well, last couple of months really um, do you swim uh, don't want to swim with it just yet like in terms of kicking and stuff oh, yeah, true. Um, true. but yeah I, I had done like I was swimming um, a couple of times a week down in Nelson like when I was fit before I did my ankle um, and like I'd go down and do a K or a K and a half in the pools um, on, on day off or sometimes after training I'd go down there in the afternoon and um, especially on a Monday on a, sh- on a smaller day like mm-hmm. gym, gym was kind of the only big thing you'd only do a couple of K on the field at training at like a jog pace and a few conditioning games then go to the pool get a couple of K down or something but um, yeah love swimming eh? mm-hmm. you do a bit of that too? I used to swim yeah but that's one of those like black line fever things mm-hmm. <laughs> I can, you know I can swim obviously but um, no, I don't I have been thinking about it because like I said I was at the gym and then sort of we're moving in here ended the gym we're going to buy some equipment but mm. that looks like it's months away from oh no yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, look, you look on the website and the out of stock out of stock you're like oh good <laughs> yeah 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 shit. No, and, it's a good way to like for, it's definitely good for the lungs eh? like it's yeah. totally different to running around on a field or lifting weights like should I go to the pool and I'll like I'll kind of change it up each time like you know like you kind of warm up with like 10 lengths and then from there like I'll, I'll often do like interval stuff so you know I'd, I'd I'd usually start off with, you know, a couple of sixes and fours. So I'll go like six, four, six, four, and then I'll do like um, just all freestyle, and then and then you do like two like full pace laps, and then you take like thirty seconds, and then you do like six laps straight after that, and like trying to trying to just keep your form and keep mm-hmm. swimming while you're absolutely like <laughs> absolute buggered, because um, like you know for me now to do do like fifty meters full pace like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you're, you're you're sucking in the big ones at the end of it and take 30 seconds to go again but um no i find it bloody good for the lungs though especially around the footy like yeah it definitely helps do you have a physiologist at modern uh yeah yeah we got a couple of physios there so i don't know like someone measuring was, measuring all your metrics and gps and oh yes yeah, sorry yeah. yeah 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 um so our trainer does that okay. along so we've got like a trainer assistant trainer and then also like an intern yep so our intern's kind of in charge of what like, say the whole GPS side of things so we, we're GPS every time we're on the field every yeah. time we play everything's GPS and then like they kind of manage your manage your load through the week yeah and yeah. and obviously depending like if you're playing that week how much game time you might be getting if you're starting you're on the bench whatever um you know and then same as the week before so you know your load's pretty like pretty well managed from all of them and they'll pull you out of training like when they need to and yeah if you need more then you'll be doing conditioning games with a group of guys at the end of end of training and stuff like that so yeah um and often if you play less than like oh i can't even remember well, i've only played two games this year so it's actually hard to remember <laughs> often, often if you play like less than 15 or 20 minutes you got to run at the end of the game yep, so like yep. as soon as the whistle goes basically like shake hands and stuff and then you're like you're in like everyone's signing autographs and stuff and you're on the sideline running running and just running well, mm-hmm. just trying to get more meters in because mm-hmm. otherwise your weekend is, ends up being too low and you're, yep. you're not going to run the next day because otherwise you end up having like three days of running in a row because mm-hmm. you need a day off but and you can't it's one of those things you just can't, can't catch up on eh? so yep. like, if you're not getting your running in it like topping yourself up in the game then it's pretty hard so yeah how much work sort of been done around preparedness like are you going in and doing a grip test or someone's looking at your heart rate variability or anything like that no, nah. <laughs> no, <don't think> so. <laughs> nah. nah. Yeah. So oh. it, it, there's, there's still like um, a bit of survivorship going on in, in rugby union, then, isn't it? Like, yeah, I yeah. think like down in Nelson, we're like in Tassie, it's like it pretty well like play driven. So like if mm-hmm. you're like in terms of like if you're you got to prepare your body as best you can for training and yep. to play and all of that and. That's it. Like, you know, that's you've got to survive and be durable, durable with it, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's that's what being professional is, you know. So, 
like you've got to prepare yourself best for training so you can get the most out of training yeah. to improve and then prepare yourself as best you can to play so that you can play well and yeah. you know get better and play better for your team and um, I suppose what oh, where was I going with this now um, you see so it's like quite player, player driven the yeah, load like the load side of things so like if you're not feeling good like you know, you like it's up to you to be able to go and tell your trainer that and be like, you know, my hammy is genuinely quite tight today. Like, mm-hmm. if you've pulled up pretty tight the next morning, like your calf or your hammy and stuff, like it's it's genuinely quite important about it. Like, go up to your physio, go up to your trainer and tell them that, and they'll manage you from that. Like, whether it's to do with like your max speeds and stuff, like at training, like you might be at like a seventy percent cap or something like that. So, mm-hmm. like, whatever you do, like you can't go over seventy percent if your hammy's tight or your calf's tight or something like that, or like your scrum load like you might just do a couple of scrums instead of scrumming the whole scrum session like you might just do a couple of scrums get what you need done mm. and then pull pin on, on the scrums and focus on the rest of training or whatever so it's you know there's there's a lot of um, you know player driven in and around how your body's feeling like, like, and I suppose over time as well you start to understand that a wee bit as well like mm-hmm. being a young fella you're kind of oh it's all good it's just sore from training so yeah, you hard. go again it's all good and then you end up you know, tearing your calf or something, it's like, oh shit, but you start to learn that pretty quickly and learn how your body should feel for training or if you haven't quite done something right in, in your recovery, then um, then you kind of know um, and you definitely feel it. So yeah, it's um, pretty player driven down there and it is, especially on the bigger scenes as well, I suppose. I don't know what it's like in other Mighty 10 Cup teams, but um, yeah, we've got a lot of responsibility as a player to look after yourself, eh? So, yeah. Yeah. Has there been like a um, switch going from put persevering, pushing through, trying to get your your name on on the list for Saturday to thinking about it as a rugby career? Like especially as a as a prop, like there's always things to learn as a prop and to be a great prop. You know, is is has there been a moment where it's like I'm going to make this a career for as long as it possibly can versus. Oh, I'm going to play it this Saturday. <laughs> yeah, I oh, know what you mean. Um, well, I'd, I'd never thought of rugby as a career, even I don't know, up until probably just before, oh, and around that New Zealand twenties time when I was in my second year out of school. Like yep. that was kind of, I was kind of like, oh shit, like you know, like um, I could actually like make money doing this, like yeah. you know, like because you're you're dairy farming. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah we're like, trying to. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was pulling tits on the farm and you know milking cows and going to training in the morning training at night like you know just trying to make it crust and Probably killing yourself <laughs> yeah literally yeah. Um, but um, I don't know like I was probably yeah it, well, after New Zealand 20s finished that's kind of when I was like shit like you know like I want to play like Mighty 10 Cup and um, and then from there ended up obviously getting an opportunity down in Tasman because um, yeah why could I so called shafted me nah um, the, the, the opportunity wasn't there I probably you know might not have earned the spot there as such I suppose I don't know and opportunity opened up down in Tasman so I found myself down there and then from there I've kind of just wanted to just take that next step and just keep climbing up the ladder really and mm. you know make a career out of it but um, you know had a few few road cones and a few speed bumps along the way but um, you know a couple of road cones getting caught in the back tyre but um, <laughs> um yeah, and then, I don't know, I've never really looked at it as just Saturday to Saturday, like, you know, just trying to get named, like, obviously, um, sometimes, you know, there, there is, like, pretty good competition in, say, my position or other guys' competition that, yeah, like, you do everything you can that week and usually the week before to try and get named for, for that Saturday and um, to be playing and, and yeah, and then from there you get your opportunity to, to showcase yourself, show like what you've been working on and like, you know, just do your best for the team, do your job and um, from the opportunities kind of open up and, you know, it's like, but yeah, there is kind of times when you're like, shit, like, you know, am I still going to be able to keep doing this? Like, you know, yeah. you're like, if I'm not getting selected or like, especially after my injury, I'm kind of like, shit, well, like, you know, I've barely played this year, like, am I even going to be able to get a gig? Like, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, but it's not really a Saturday to Saturday thing. It's kind of like, you know, I've kind of always just had the dream and kind of always thought I'm, like, believed I'm good enough to yeah. kind of keep going. But, you know, you've got to make sure you're good enough as well. Like, you can't just think that if you're not good enough. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So, so structurally, like, we saw Adi Sevilla met, essentially manage himself. Mm-hmm. Like, how, how, how do you structure 
um, Ryan Cox and incorporated Cox's lawns. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you What do you mean with that? Like, like with his yeah. How do, how do you sort of negotiate and, and who supports you and that sort of stuff? Uh, well, so I've got an agent. He he does all my like rugby stuff and goes looking elsewhere and whatnot for me and finds all that stuff. But for me, like I'm just genuinely just trying to be the best athlete I can. Mm-hmm. And like most of the time, you don't actually need like I don't think you really need an agent most of the time. Like like if you pl- the better you play mm. um you know the opportunity is just going to open up like you know if you're if you're good enough then you're going to be good enough like you mm. know you don't need someone going to searching for a job for you because they'll come to you yep um so is that what you're getting with yeah yeah getting yeah. That with that yeah so um i've been with my agent through esportif since i was at school actually pretty funny when he rang me up i think i was on the bus back from like year 12 camp i was still at school in year 12 when when he rang me up and I was like pretty loud on the bus and he, he, I was getting this phone call and I was like what the heck like random number picked it up and he was like oh hey is this uh, Ryan Cox and it's uh, Dan Kane here and I thought he was saying Sam Kane <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm like sorry who and genuinely said that like I was like, who, like who's this yeah. like four times like he must have been like oh, this is weird like you know like like <laughs> whatever and because I genuinely thought he's and you're like 17 Sam Kane. Years, 16 or 17 years old, and you, and yeah, just turned 17, I think. Yeah, didn't think to explain. I'm on a school bus, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Eh? I was like, oh, pretty loud, but no, nah, yeah. I didn't, didn't even think about saying that. And I, like, I was like, why the hell would Sam Kane call me? Like, that's that's just weird. Like, um, and yeah, I thought it was like a bit of a scam or something at the time. Um, and then yeah, anyway, he kind of got to the point of player agent and he wanted to meet up and have coffee and stuff and just you know just have a yarn and just meet me and stuff and yeah and then so had that relationship with him which has been awesome um ever since and he's kind of represented me in terms of and you know they yeah for people that don't know what what an agent does they kind of they go out they find you a gig with they, they talk to ceos and coaches and stuff like that and they'll like off teams like whether they're trying to find your contract or keep your contract ongoing at that team and then from there they'll go through your contracts and um, whether it's to do with your salary or bonuses or just make sure there's no hidden clauses or anything mm-hmm. like that in there and um, so they read over all of that kind of like a bit of a lawyer I suppose in some respect and um, and then if if, if you want to try and go somewhere else or you need more money or whatever then you know that the other person that will try and like bleed that out of them or something for you so mm-hmm. no he's been pretty awesome for me over, over the time and kind of done a job for me I suppose so yeah pays for himself um, so how much there's because there's salary cap in Mighty 10 right uh, yeah people say there's not with Tasman but yeah no there is <laughs> um, definitely a salary uh, cap <laughs> yeah, yeah no there is a salary cap I can't actually remember what it is at the moment so it just got lowered I think yeah I think it might have just got lowered at Tasman I can't actually remember what it is though what, so you, what was the reasoning behind lowering it to make the competition more affordable uh, I genuinely don't know yeah. I think it was like almost accidentally too high because we just got a new CEO and I think our old CEO just had like a high salary cap just because he he could. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there is there is so it's, so it's based caps. on it's, team to team sort of thing. Yeah, or like there's a I think there's a like nationwide salary cap as such, but yeah. then like t- it's, it's kind of up to CEOs like how much they pay each player, and they'll have like their own caps of what they can afford and mm-hmm. stuff as well, and try and make it work themselves. Like yeah. So yeah, because obviously there's a salary for each team, and it's it's the same for every team. Mm. So, um, but like you know, some teams might actually might genuinely contract one or two more players than other teams, and that's taken up salary. And so, like obviously, the average salary is going to be less yep. all round. But you know, it's kind of there's ways in the round. I don't know too much about it. Like that's that's up to the big dogs. But yeah, yeah. I so just kind of get paid and play rugby and do my job really. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on the job side of things, like uh, there's sort of that opportunity for brand and, and that sort of stuff, but that can be at the detriment of your concentration or your ability to you, you mean know, in terms of your personal brand personal brand yeah, stuff. yeah 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 so like what what sort of the yarns going around about ideas of doing that um i don't know like and you, is anyone cracking it yet yeah, yeah. um <laughs> Hardy's making clothes <laughs> yeah it's pretty sick eh? it's pretty awesome it's also what uh, jimmy ma doing what a lad podcast oh, like, yeah, how good's that how good is good um have you been on that good. No, I haven't, mate. No, yeah, no, no. Geez. I don't know. There's some pretty big dogs that go on there. Um, like Chucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly, mate. Like, there's, some, there's some big dogs that go on there. Like, I don't know if I'm quite up to that stand today, but hey, you know, maybe one day if I get, get the wee invite. Like, James. Hey. Yeah, mate, come on. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't know. Like, obviously, he's doing pretty well. A couple of other guys have had a few little side hustles going on. I'm just trying to think now who else has got got a couple. Um, uh, well, you did Coxie's lawns, mate. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, had, had we Coxie's lawns going on the side there. So, uh, what, what gear did you get, by the way? Should I have heaps, mate? So I started off at Bunnings. Eh? I went to Bunnings, spent five hundred bucks. I think it was bought a weed eater, a lawnmower, some wool sacks. Yeah. Uh, that was probably just about it. Maybe some oh, uh, a little wee sprayer and a bottle yeah, of spray and stuff. A spray, um, but a roundup. So that's what I need um, to do around here again. Actually, do the yeah. old get a, get a whipper snipper. Yeah, and some handy, spray. A handy. Um, so I started off with that, and then eventually built up um, o- over a couple of years, and end up getting um, having a good mate still shop Hermes. So you know, get along still shop Hermes. Um, get along there and um, grab your gear. So. I, I grabbed the rest of my gear through there once I'd upgraded so I ended up getting a mass sport uh, 5000 and uh, absolute beast I think it was 24 inch alloy chassis and um, <laughs> I think they were oh, is this a ride on? no 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 uh, Pushmar yeah. but um, yeah bit of a beast Pushmar so I picked it up second hand but I think they, they retail in around a grand or 1100 uh, I think it was about a grand for a um, Pushmar for a Pushmar yeah but has it got like automatic oh shit like the it's self-propelling or no 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 it's no it's not i don't really like them because they're quite like those ones are genuinely they're even bigger again yeah and are quite heavy Uh, whereas i had mine on the back of my ute with a couple of bungees holding it on so i need to be able to lift it on and off was this the rodeo yeah on the old holding rodeo mate still going strong Um, it's still around yeah still around still around so clocking up the case on that so (laughs) it's been like coxie's lawns icon eh? is like the the blue beast the blue beast so bushwhack um Mm. and so, oh, excuse me, Jesus. Um, these wee solders getting me a bit, bit gassy, eh? Yeah. Bloody good, though. The yummy. Old, the old um, f- so, fermented apples. <laughs> yeah, exactly, mate. <laughs> so, yeah, I ended up having all my gear through um, through steel shops. So I had um, hedge trimmer, leaf blower, uh, weed eater, and then uh, chainsaw as well. I'll do tree work. So I did hedges, tree like smaller trees. I had a wee crack at a few bigger trees. I definitely like pushed the boundaries a few times. That's for sure. Um, but need, needed a climbing I arborist. Had, yeah, I genuinely. Like, I, I had like basically the smallest chainsaw, uh, petrol chain, which is like your MS one eighty. I think they oh they might have had one seventies, but I think I got a one eighty. I can't remember. And um, like it's nothing massive, but you know as long as you've got a sharp chain, you can genuinely cut through anything. Like yeah. you'll get there. Um, just don't let your chain go blind, otherwise it's hard work. Um, and then. Yeah, I'd, I'd do everything, all section maintenance really, but yeah, started off with lawns and then got into just doing everything because, you know, it, your old Joe blog, oh, can you do this, can you do that? And, yeah. You know, and you kind of just wing it like, I'd never done I'd never done any of that stuff before. Like, I'd, I'd barely even cut a hedge before Yeah. Um, when I'd started doing that stuff. I'd done, done it at home, but that was, that was about it. And then you just kind of learn along the way and kind of, you know, you just kind of. Did you have a garden at home? Or, well, I drove past a place the other day, dairy farm, and it just looked like house. And then the fence is like, you know, we can't make money from a garden. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's valuable paddock space. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, we got a good veggie garden at home actually. And, um, yeah, we got a couple of good gardens. That mum, mum got garden up at home. So uh, we native native little section as well with a few cody nice. trees and stuff in it. But. Um, yeah, that was kind of mum's area. I didn't really do too much at home. I was kind of just lawns at home. That was about it. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I'd just, you know, I'd, I'd actually even barely used a chainsaw before. Like, I was just self taught. Everything was just self taught, like on the job. Like, you I just still haven't used a chainsaw. And, you've never used a chainsaw? No, I, I did um, some scrub cutting at my mate's place last year. Yeah, yeah. And then the um, bearing on the scrub cutter blew. So that was the end of that. Uh. And then, so then I went to go back and chop chop the um the roots of all the gorse down and went to did yeah. like one pull on the chainsaw and the rope broke and i was like oh that's that too oh, shit, <laughs> so still haven't used a chainsaw <laughs> oh it's not the one <laughs> it's not great i was like i was like oh classic yeah you see me out the back and i bloody break both things <laughs> yeah fucking hell um like I'd, I'd use a chainsaw a couple of times on the farm at home but like not much to be fair. I went down to the steel shop, got got me chaps, got me helmet, yeah, got me chainsaw and my oils and stuff like that. A couple of chains and um, yeah, I was just just self taught, eh? Um, yeah. And then um, watch a few YouTube videos or not even that. No, not even that. Like I didn't even read the manual, eh? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think 
I think my first time, I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't actually get it started. I was like, this is taking ages to get started. I was like there for like five minutes, putting my arms going numb kind of material. It's like, nah, surely something's wrong. It was brand new. Yeah. Take it back in the steel shop and like, I'm like, how do you work this? I get it going like first go. I think I had like, I think I didn't even turn it up, like the choker or something like whatever. Yeah. I, I can't even remember now. Um, but yes, we did. Like, puts the choke one way, pulls, pulls. No, no, it doesn't start. Puts it the other way. Boom. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it was that one. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. like it says, says on it, like I think it's never start standing up or something like that. Like always put it on the ground to start start yeah. the old chainsaw. But like you know, and like whenever it's warm, I'd just stand there and just, like standing up and just get it going straight. Like stand down, like you know, don't don't need to be putting my back out bending over. But um, yeah, shit, you t- I, I, oh, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but yeah, told a few white lies. Like you know, I could do this, I can do that, and I'd never done it before. Yeah, and like just you know, just having a crack at it, and like you know, you just have a go like and if you if you fuck it up you fuck it up like yeah. at the end of the day but you know you try and do what you can and do the best job but and insurance <laughs> what did you do no I, I, I actually had insurance I had um through so I had um accountant lawyer and insurance for for my business yeah. um, they're all actually down in now so just from people that I know down there and um so I just had that all set up down there so I had was it like your public liability and stuff like that so if I was to uh, Arguments say like um, fall a tree and it knocked a power pole over or whatever, yeah, and then yeah. that went onto the road, and then um, you know there's power cut out or whatever. Like, I've covered for all of that, or if I accidentally dug through like a, a main a mains yeah. or water or something like that, I've covered for all that shit or whatever. Like all that that who hard not covered for. Oh, I don't know. Is it? I actually don't even know if that covers like if I like break a house from the tree or something. <laughs> Like, I can't actually tell you or like whatever I, I don't know about that or if I forget me handbrake and me ute and it goes rolling down the drive onto the road and fuck shit up but yeah to be fair I don't actually I didn't even read it eh? I was just like mate I just need like you know I'm going to do this I need covered <laughs> yeah yeah the insurance broker just sorted it out and um, you know happy days and I was like yeah sweet all good as long as I'm covered yeah you'll be covered for what you need and he kind of told me what I was covered for but I can't actually remember half of it but yeah yeah yeah. and so as an occupational hazard what did the what did the rugby union think of your your wee gig um I can't actually remember I um so I started it when I was down in in Nelson it was in the offset like not in my 10 cup it was yeah. club season so I started it as like a job down there because I couldn't actually hold down a full time job yeah um due to like footy I was getting called in and out like injury replacement at super rugby and um, so I couldn't hold down an actual job and so I started it up to was that kind of, when you went down to Christchurch or yeah, was that different oh, yeah. yeah yeah when I was like getting called down to Christchurch uh, with Crusaders like week in week out kind of thing it was pretty tough so going. they need you to train and stuff yeah so like they had like injuries and stuff like that and so I'd like go down there to train like for like two or three days or something and then uh, for like extra numbers with them and then they'd fly me back to Nelson and then I'd go down like one or two weeks later for like a whole <laughs> week or something and then yeah it was a bit of like it was, it was, that it was awesome like, like unreal being around some of those guys and the stuff you learn it was wicked but you know obviously on the on that on the job side of things as well like when you're not down there and you can't count on being down there all the time like couldn't hold down a job so that hence why I started up Cox's Lawns and then um where were we going with this just tell us about it mate (laughs) I can't even remember now but hey um and then oh yeah the rugby scene and then um, yeah, oh, that's it's right, just yeah. kind of my job, so I, I know it's turned into a job, really. And I suppose it's no different than being a chippy or whatever. Right? Yeah, no, no different, really. But yeah, it got a little bit niggly when kind of it did come around a footy season. I still had clients that needed their lawns mowed and stuff, so I was I was proper like training all day, and then I'd like a couple of hours of daylight at the end. Of, like especially when you know footy seasons kicking off in July, August, September, and like you know it's getting dark at six thirty, seven o'clock, and you know, rains we, we, yeah or it rains and like we finish training and say like three o'clock or something and then i'd go out and do like lawns until six yeah so like um get the jobs done that you needed to get done so um because i still had those clients that like well, i could have told them like you know i'm finished like, i'm going into footy but kind of almost felt like i just wanted to keep it going just like letting people down like you know you just, yeah. just want to kind of do the work for them and um keep them happy as well at the same time so um and then yeah same as Oh, it's kind of just always been like that I've just kind of made it work yeah all the way through and like have, have, I've had no issues with like the rugby scene yeah stuff like that they've, they've always been all for it because it keeps you fit so I don't how's the food prep for that type of thing <laughs> yeah sometimes in the weekends you got to prep a wee bit eh? um, <laughs> occasionally you get caught out got to grab a bit of sushi or yeah or something like that I don't know but 
um, usually like pretty prepped um, but like you're surprising like don't get that hungry when you're working all the time like you can kind of just snack like yeah. snack on like a bit of fruit along the way like I'd like say if I was working a full day like um, like through I think it was first lockdown last year we come out of that and because I was contracted with the Chiefs I was um, we weren't out, we weren't allowed uh, sorry we weren't allowed to train in level 3 yeah. um, you could only train in small bubbles and keep doing what you're doing and I, I, like, but I could get back to work with Coxie's Lawn so I like, talked to New Zealand Rugby Union and stuff like that and made sure it was all good first and I was allowed to go and work so I was so I think it was for three weeks there in level three or whatever it was um, I was just like 11 hours a day just working <laughs> like I didn't stop for a break or anything like your break is when you drive Driving, yeah. but like most of the time the longest you're in the car for is like tops 10 minutes because mm-hmm. like you, you set your set your uh, route so that you know you do one lap around the city kind of thing so yep. you, you get all the jobs so you're not zigzagging all over the show um, so I'd just eat and drink along the way um, <laughs> And I was doing eleven hour days, and I wasn't even I didn't train that whole time. Yeah. So for like, so I trained all the lockdown, and then got to like that, and I just stopped training. I was just like, I was like, nah, like I was I was too gassed just from work because I had heaps of work lined up from mm. lockdown, which was awesome. Um, and then I just didn't train, and I think I oh, I lost like four or five clicks. Mm-hmm. Um, I was eating, I was still eating good, but I was just snacking instead of like I didn't, never had like a proper lunch. I was mm-hmm. just like. Mm-hmm couple of mouthfuls of my lunch between one job then a couple of mouthfuls again after and stuff like that and then I'd come back and then and we had like testing and everything like that when we come back I like, tested bloody well I think I knocked about six seconds off my Bronco and skinnies went down 10 mil and weight was down and yeah even my strength numbers were still sweet like they're, they're like the same so yeah. good, considering good. I had no weights in lockdown but yeah and then so and that was mint that was actually awesome I, that was one of the fittest I'd probably just about been actually like yeah. I go through five t-shirts a day of just sweat, like <laughs> yum. <laughs> like it was, it was full disgusting. I had like ten t-shirts dedicated to work, and they were just on rotation. <laughs> um, and like you, you'd have change of jocks and shorts occasionally as well, just because it's just it, hideous. Like it, it's actually filthy, eh? Like it's yuck. Like you're wringing sweat out of this shit. Like, <laughs> um, like you're going through like seven, eight liters of water a day, like yeah. without a doubt. And, but no, nah, it's good fun. Love it. So. Good fun. Yeah. So you, you said the sushi and like if the halfback puts the kick up and it goes within the ten years of your coffee, is, are those two things quite quite good currency in the rugby scene for for yeah. balls and up? Yeah. Sushi, sushi and coffee, like yeah, always on. Or like we like eggs bedding or something like. Oh you know, yeah, like take, take you out for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like obviously when you're cutting grass, you have no time for that shit. But hey, like like full rugby season, like yeah, now nah, we we eggs bedding or something like that, or sometimes lunch. Yeah, no. Nah always goes down a treat or you know after golf uh, like Anton if he needs to shout me lunch because he's lost lost to me at golf like up at Cinnamon or something like that like what I used to get up there I, was, oh, I think I used to get the fritters or something like that up there yeah used to go down a treat that was my so. and so what would your wage of playing golf would it be a hole or the, the game <laughs> oh, no it, so it'd be like be a whole round it would play like say um, handicap match play or something like that or whatever and um Oh, shit, well, it would often be lunch sometimes occasionally like if there's races on that weekend would be like $50 multi or something like that and yeah well that, they'd pay it for you sorry they'd pay the multi for you well whoever lost had to put the multi on so say say if you played me and I won yeah. you'd have to I'd choose a multi yeah. and you have to go put a $50 multi on my choice of whatever it is Yeah. and then if it comes in then we half it Oh yeah. yeah. but if it loses it's your 50 bucks it's your 50 you know what I mean <laughs> like, like that, that, that's the cost of like losing but um yeah no it was um no it was usually lunch and lunch and coffee yeah mm, it's usually yeah. usually the wager so yeah and uh yeah he'd pull a few kits out of his ass here's for sure <laughs> so you, you put you put up the bit the bits there mate you were on the uh, mobile star the other day How, what's what's your connection with with the racehorses i actually have the um to my O'Connor name the infamous kelly evander she raced 152 starts without a place i think it was <laughs> oh my lord it wasn't good had she had the most starts in the season too holy smoke is that in new zealand yeah, yeah. Oh, look her up kelly you, kelly evander brian o'connor you poor thing oh my he, God. he actually he actually um drove her a few times too trained trained owned and often driven <laughs> Shit. um yeah. yeah no i was on the on the old mobile behind uh was it race eight at eddington oh yeah that's right you're in crush <laughs> yeah i popped down in crush for a little bit catch up with a few of the guys and stuff down there <coughs> excuse me and then um 
yeah oh just went to races down there and um and yeah like through mates and stuff through people you know or managed to get on on the old mobile for a race down there that was bloody wicked eh? yeah. um, so, so do you follow the the trotters and paces or yeah yeah no yeah. Did, like follow their mates good fun to watch so um not not thoroughbreds you know yeah no I fo- follow you follow the, it all you follow, follow the whole damn a lot um <laughs> you're, you're, you're a rugby racing and beer type guy yeah no i don't know i just enjoy watching it eh? and following it and like kind of like yeah i don't know i find it pretty intriguing eh? and yeah um how did i get into it i can't even remember i kind of oh, i got into it through one of my cousins i think and he kind of just taught me a wee bit about it and what not and, um, and then just kind of learn, learn a bit about it like, along the way and yeah no it's it's pretty good to follow and um, yeah so. so have you got a syndicate going on or, or what yeah so I've got a, got a wee horse at the moment so um, yeah, like your own one yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> so got, got shares on a horse uh, that I've had for a wee while now and Arnie's army and um, just on a spell at the moment actually so um, uh, she's or he is down in Invercargill at the moment and that, that's kind of where he's based so um, he's down there in the mighty shithole of New Zealand uh, hey, hey, no, hey. no 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 it was the asshole of New Zealand yeah <laughs> sorry oh, yeah. Um, so but the world in fact huh? <laughs> yeah probably yeah yeah um, but hey no he's going right down there and um, and yes yeah, so that's just through a syndicate with off and racing it's um, yeah pretty easy to get into and it's bloody awesome and like awesome like so good for say your joe blog who enjoys watching a race doesn't know too much about it but yeah. cheap for them to just buy into a horse like if you want a percent or something like it's it's so easy to just get into yeah um so yeah highly recommend it and does it get your uh, ticket into the birdcage and all that jazz probably probably yeah. <laughs> you have to go um, watch it <laughs> well, arnie's army yeah so um <laughs> i actually got into cup week actually like you know even though with lockdown and stuff like yeah. i managed to get into tickets to um cup week so like we had to, had to buy them that like 150 bucks each or whatever but yeah got along to to cup week it was only a max of like 150 people or something in there um for the races at addington but that was bloody awesome because arnie's army he was actually well his name his stable name's arnold so i just call him that or arnie and um and he was entered in a couple of in a race there but then ended up getting pulled um, just pulled up a bit lame I think it was after his, one of his races the week before or whatever and then um, so he didn't race there but got along to that as well and yeah kind of just followed the wee horse he's seen but he's, going, he's been going pretty good since I owned him he's raced so four times he's uh, third in his first race then he won the following week Oof. and then he got third I think it was the week following and then had another second so you know four races four top top threes it's you know can't complain too much so yeah. he's going pretty well and it's pretty awesome to watch eh um so yeah no it's pace on feet eh <laughs> oh I don't know about that but <laughs> <laughs> pretty hard to make ends meet off horses but good to watch I suppose anyway and it's like you know a good way to learn a bit more about it and kind of have something to follow as well eh um yeah. so yeah for anyone that, that's looking to get into the horsey scene and in the, the old um harness racing then you know, uh, look up off and racing with uh, Andrew Fitzgerald, and uh, yeah, yeah uh, have have we read up, and yeah, I think you know you can get you can buy into horses as cheap as a couple of hundred bucks these days. Like yeah, yeah. you know, like say if you wanted to just you know buy a percent or whatever in a horse, like sometimes you can get in for three hundred bucks. You know, so it's it's pretty good and have a bit of fun. Yeah, like you might not exactly make money off it or whatever or you, you might if it goes goes well but like you know you're only putting 300 bucks and you can't expect to make 10 grand or anything but mm. um you know it's just something to follow and you know you've got a part of that horse so mm. yeah cool so going full circle back to the other type of stocks you got the, the dairy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. dairy scene yeah yep. <laughs> do, do you just do you follow bulls do you follow them? like how does it even work mate? oh yeah, <laughs> yeah no I'll... do you go to some sales um, raise the finger yeah 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 um i was never allowed to raise the finger myself when i was buying back back in the day it was it was only dad he was, he was the only money no you get too carried away boy like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no no it's my money it's all good but um been to a couple of sales before um so yeah been like i don't know through through me old man like uh, being brought, brought up being quite passionate about genetics and breeding mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Ooh, that side of things so those um, mines were specials <laughs> yeah so um, I, I went, went to the mines or sales I wanted to buy a couple of cows one day and 
Um, I think it was about yeah, just after I left school and saved up enough money to buy a couple of Morrisville specials. So is what what we call them. And uh, you yeah, went to the sales there and bought a couple of rising two year olds. And um, yeah, kind of from there. Oh yeah, just built. So built I, as a rising two year old, that's just purely genetics. There's there's no there's no productions they hadn't carved yep. before. There's no production record yep. or anything like that. So you, you're just looking into genetics, but more than that, you're probably you're, you're looking at the type of the animal, like as in um, their f- well, f- for anyone that doesn't really understand, probably their figure, like mm-hmm. where their muscle groups and their bones and their udder and all of that kind of stuff. Like you know, just basically like a good looking animal, like cause and in in dairy, are you looking at the colour? <laughs> uh, yeah. You still yeah. are looking at the colours? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know those golden ones? Like, they should not be around, eh? <laughs> jerseys? Nah, no, absolutely. Pain in the ass. So you're a freezer uh, man. Yeah, freezer man. So <laughs> um, I've got my own stud as well. So um, so, I've, so my Holstein, I, I run my Frisians through my stud. So uh, my purebred Frisians, they, they go through my stud name now. So once... Um, so how that works is basically like it's just on record with the Holstein New Zealand Holstein Frisian and mm-hmm. uh, run me stock through that basically like, isn't just a record of them through that so and so do, um, you, do you get genetics done on that as well or no nah, that's just oh it's just, it, just they're just under a stud now well there's yeah. not much to it really yeah um, I think you pay 50 bucks a year for it or whatever to have it have a stud um, with, with your animals and stuff like registered through them um, and then yeah like being quite into breeding on the like bull side of things and um all the genetics and everything like that and just matching the right bulls with the right like with the right cows so um like you get all your figures and everything like that like your production figures but then you get also like like i suppose the side of things that is probably a little bit harder is being able to uh, physically pair the right animals so mm-hmm. like a smaller cow you can't mm-hmm. just go and put like the biggest bull over the smallest cow you know what i mean like mm-hmm. in terms of live weight of of calves and stuff like that because all the bulls get all these all these bloody numbers and figures printed out from all their offspring that they've had as well yeah and like will that affect birthing as well yeah exactly yeah. so you know if you've got a cow that can't push out like a 40 kilo <laughs> live weight calf like you're gonna have issues like if you're yeah. putting, putting big live weight bulls over them and but obviously production's key so you, you're trying to find the perfect balance between production but then also the best statured animal as well and, and is um, that heritable so is that very heritable do you get a pretty good yeah, yeah, like, value out of that yeah, yeah like you you build into it there's no such thing as a perfect animal like some people would say but you know you're building into it like i've, I've kind of oh, with the whole rugby thing i've kind of like been away from the farm quite a lot the last couple of years so it's been pretty hard to stay in touch with it all but um always have a wee passion for it and especially on my cows and whatnot but um yeah like it's you're always just trying to find the perfect animal like like would not find it but breed the perfect animal mm-hmm. as such and the old man's starting to do really well with that now and what happens eventually is you build up your, your cows get good enough to then get contracted from your bull companies and stuff like that like, like ambridge LICs and stuff and they'll contract your cow and what, what get, that means get, oh do they get embryos as well? Or yeah, you can, you can flush animals and yeah. get embryos and stuff as well, which sometimes you do if you've got like a real good family line coming through or something like that, which my dad does a wee bit of. Not not massive on the big embryo scene, but he does do a bit of it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like when you get a contract cow, basically like if it has a bull calf, which is what the embryo companies want, yeah. you want heifer calves, but they want bull calves, which is all good. And then like they want the bulls like the the sons for their breeding centers to be able to then breed off them if you know what i mean so yeah, yeah. like that's that's one of my goals to get one of my cows like, like to be a contracted cow so that you can then so does that diversify your cow a little bit as well so if you're getting bulls you're getting some money and if you're getting um yeah if then you get you've got some production yeah yeah exactly and then and and you're breeding it's another generation out of your, out of your cow you know what i mean mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. um like you're able to breed another generation so all of a sudden you've bred a better animal yeah 90 percent of the time you've probably bred a better animal out of that cow um and so like you know herds are just getting better and better all the time and so um yeah whereas if you're getting a bull then that goes off to the breeding c- or it can go off to the breeding center if it passes all their bloody requirements which you know sometimes they don't but and then it's just worth ends meat really but um yeah like so i think you know there's a couple of options you can do if the breeding companies want want your bull it's like they could buy it outright for five grand wow <laughs> which is you know compared to 150 or 200 bucks at the yeah, bull works. sales at the, oh okay yeah. uh, so they go off to like uh, off to the calf sales and stuff like that yeah, yeah. most of the time but compared to that like so is that to be finished 
yeah so like you've got nothing to do with it basically like yep. you, you sell it to the uh, to the breeding companies and then um, otherwise you have a second option which is what I would do and what my dad does with all his animals which is you uh, it's kind of like a lease so you sell or you get two and a half grand they take they take your bull and they you end up getting royalties off all the semen like off mm-hmm. the straw so say like in in the dairy sector it's called like, like you, you you have a straw which has the semen in it and mm-hmm. that's what you um, get your cows pregnant with basically uh, through AI and then um, so you get royalties off that when, whenever they're sold so often to buy semen from straw it's your top bulls are anything from 16 to 24 dollars a straw mm-hmm. um so that's that can be what are most herds like 250 300 uh average herd in the country is around 460 470 oh, cows so yeah. <laughs> multiply that by by that you know it's costing you a few dollars so um but then like on the other side of things like it's it's only a, it's almost a side hustle as such for mm-hmm. for most guys anyway that that kind of side of things but um yeah like if you're if you get a top a, a bull that actually comes through the ranks and he's he does pretty well and then you can get you end up doing all right and you know you can make a few grand off him or or sometimes even more um if they do pretty well so yeah there's quite a lot to it actually but hey yeah the, econ- the economics of farming eh? i love it yeah, <laughs> that's, why, that's why i love going to the deer sales eh? just like looking at all the genetics seeing what sort of prices go for things yeah try yeah. try for, like you say try to figure out what everyone's looking at what, what it is about a certain animal that you know creates a bidding war and that sort of stuff yeah. it's just real real fun and you speaking know. of the stags actually um my grandfather's real good mates with a guy who had the nz record two years in a row for the heaviest antlers oh work it um i think correct me if i'm wrong i think it must have been in the around 13 or 14 kilos would that be right yeah um, <laughs> i think it's a so, it's a big like a, a velvet yeah, yeah, yeah. Velvet. So that, um, so that's off his his stag in like one season, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so he actually, <laughs> funny thing is, when I was when I was at young farmers, I'd actually gone and picked up hay from one day. Didn't know he was friends with my grandparents, and then um, <laughs> picked up hay from him and you know admired his stags through the fence because he has he only has like thirty odd running around. Like, was oh, that Todd Crowley? Nah, no. I can't. I can't bloody remember his name now. He's an old dog, but oh, okay, yeah, he's an absolute lad. He's just up Tofoddy Way. Okay, so he just lives in Tofoddy there uh, between Minesville and Cambridge. And what's his name? Yeah, I can't remember now. But um, yeah, he um, he had New Zealand record for a year, maybe two years in a row. Wow, um, and some like massive animals, like huge heads on the man. <laughs> but yeah, he, he was right into his breeding for a long time, and then he just downsized just to his top animals kind yeah. of thing. So. Oh, yeah, wow. but no, that's just my little yarn about, my about the deer. With that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know too much. Need to look into it. Yeah, so. No, awesome, Coxie. Cool. Well, we're running out of light and the bloody sky's crying again. Yeah, it is. As it does in this place. That's why dairy's so good, eh? Yeah, and that's why toke's so good, mate. Like, weather's great. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, it's brilliant man. for um, growing grass and growing trees. Yeah, it is. Just like being at the beach, though. Like, almost. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, <laughs> you know but yeah growing grass making milk growing trees yeah yeah it's no. toked through and through for you isn't it what and one other thing but we won't go there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah oh and KFC yeah no that's oh, right that's not too bad no KFC or the um, was it Ma Baker's oh that's right country fried yeah. chicken yeah no that goes well as well yeah but my wee favourite actually used to be East and West Fish and Chip Shop hey okay yeah cheese and mayo there yeah, you get like, like a five dollar chip, loaded yeah. fry top thing, cheesy Kinda, cheesy wheezy. Fr- yeah, well, that, yeah, cheesy wheezies anywhere else, but yeah, like I don't know, they they were the best. They eh? what <laughs> east east and west fish and chip shop when I was at school. I'd go from intermediate, um, was it inter- yeah, whatever. We'd, we'd walk, we'd grab like fish and chip, like hot chips on the way to footy training, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> have a feed of that like carb uh, load. Man. Carb load. Yeah, it was either that we'll head down to the island church just down the road and yeah. uh, grab, grab a dozen donuts on the way island donuts oh so yum actually one of the girls bought those in the other day <laughs> I don't know what to think of them really <laughs> oh they're just yummy they're just yummy yeah, yeah. so where's it, where's East where's Chips of Blood down on Leith Place there Leith Pl- oh right right yeah. in town <laughs> yeah like right in town yeah, yeah like that was that starting was, to learn some roads <laughs> yeah, yeah so I, I haven't been back there for a couple of years actually but yeah that was that was my go to that was, that was the place like you know get like cheese and mayo on, uh, on your chips and it's unreal like 
go to other places like I've been elsewhere and so, like oh it was a damn Tanaki one time with a mate down there and they had like tomato sauce with it yeah. it was like mayo tomato sauce and cheese it was disgusting there's a good cheesy wheezies in, in New Plymouth um, like right near the um, the, ba- the bay that's inside the boulder bank yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no nah, can't remember what that suburb's called but yeah, yeah they, they did good cheesy wheezies oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no one of me phase but yeah anyway brilliant bro yeah Thanks for coming along. And no, all good, mate. All good. Wrap it up. Yes, Cheers. Yes. No, thanks. Oh, mate. Yeah. You've, you've, never, you've never been on before. No, I haven't actually. So, mate, what what keeps you flowing along? Like, is it just mowing lawns? No, do you have like a, a mantra or a way you live your life? Um, <laughs> no, I kind of just. I used to be a real planned out, organised kind of guy, but like with rugby, like kind of being my life now, it's. I can't really look too much further than like a week or two ahead, you know. Like, yeah. Um, no, I don't know. Like, I just try and have fun and try and make sure I have a good laugh every day and yeah. Um, love a bit of banter and you know, like, no, I just just make sure I have a laugh every day. Yeah, like shit, just eat well, feel good, have a laugh. Like shit, what else can you do? Like, Brilliant. you know, just try and be happy. Like obviously you do all these other things you set up in your life to try and make yourself happy but you know you still got to have a laugh every day mate like, yeah, you know, choose it a couple of jokes or rip the old man out about something or whatnot. <laughs> like you know no, nah, just just laugh eat well and feel good so yeah awesome bro thanks for that no nah, all good mate all wrap good. it up yeah Legend. cheers mate been a pleasure yeah <laughs> oh it's weird now that you take those off eh?